radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening. Fade to Black. Bespoke Radio for the masses. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing? Today's Monday. April 26th, 2021, 117 days into the new year, only 248 days left. We are live. We are live from a bunker somewhere in the middle of nowhere. A total undisclosed location. That's right, but it is beautiful. How you doing? How you doing? All right. I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and tither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? It's Monday. That's right. What an amazing week we have got in front of us on Fade to Black. Tonight, Mike Ricksecker is here. Oh, man, and I love first-time guests, and especially first-time guests like Mike Ricksecker. And that is tonight we're talking about his new book, A Walk in the Shadows. Um, I have now read it twice. It's an amazing book. We're going to be talking about that tonight, tomorrow night. Micah Hanks of The Debrief joins us lots to talk about when it comes to the debrief there is headlines galore out there right now so we'll be doing that tomorrow night with micah wednesday night richard dolan is back with us hung out with richard a little bit over the weekend and uh it was really good and i know he was supposed to be on the show with us on uh thursday briefly um i really can't say why that didn't happen (laughs) <laughs> because it was both of our fault. It, uh, faults. It was hilarious, man. It was absolutely, uh, you know, one day Richard and I will tell, tell you guys a story, but, uh, it's really funny anyway. So Richard's going to be with us on Wednesday and Thursday night is another fader night with open lines all night long. Okay. All right. Now I was, uh, chatting, uh, with uh, Carolyn Ford a little bit uh, over the weekend. She's the best. And I, I just got to say, some of the things that she is posting right now, I wish I could have every crystal skull she posts. Man, and this is the thing. EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. You just need to go and visit the website and go down and, and look. The things that she posts online, and they're amazing, and you're like, Wow. And then you find out, you go to her website, and that's not the good stuff. Man, you just sit there and browse and look, and you need to go. EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. And when you go and you bond with your skull, use the promo code JIMMY. That's all you got to do, 10% off of your Crystal Skull order today. All right, EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. UFO Megacons coming up, folks, June 6th through the 12th. We're already... We're already at the end of April. That's it. May, June. We will be in Laughlin, Nevada, June 6th through the 12th. A real in-person conference with real people. 
So come and hang out with us. All right. All of the restrictions have been lifted for the event. All you have to do is go over to uh, Laughlin uh, UFO Megacon. The links are over at uh, JimmyChurchRadio.com. Click on that. Go and get your tickets. Figure out what you want to do. There's two hotels there. There's the Aquarius. Then there's Sister Hotel right next door. Um, do what you got to do. Get your tickets. Get your rooms. Get it booked. And we're going to go hang out. It's going to be awesome. I, I just can't wait. And uh, the links are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Okay. Follow me on Twitter. Tic Tacs. Tic Tacs. I don't get it. Are you saying I have a breath problem? Tic Tacs. <laughs> Follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. And uh, it's right there. Yeah, Eric, I'm, I'm looking at the picture now. And I'm going to talk about this in just a minute. I'm talking about Stephen Greer. And what went down with him yesterday? The hat, the hashtag F2B is the sandbox on Twitter. Come and hang out with us right there. We don't bite. Any questions uh, during the show? Hashtag F2BQ. And uh, don't take any cues from uh, IPD. I mean, he's posting comments. Can't post comments in hashtag F2BQ. It's not F2BC. Fade to black comments. That's for the sandbox. F2B. Hashtag F2B. Hashtag F2BQ is fade to black questions. You can also email throughout the show. Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. All right. Uh, where do I start? A lot of stuff went down over the weekend. And on Saturday, there was the big phone home. And I was, along with Richard Dolan, invited to jump in on the action for a few minutes. And we did. It was a lot of fun. And I want to thank everyone over there for uh, the great conversation. And then yesterday, Dr. Stephen Greer did his six-hour live stream event. And I caught most of it. Well, at least pieces of most of it. I did. And I did see the image that he talked about on the show last week. And Eric uh, Awakening Man just posted a picture of it. Let me do a retweet right here. I'm going to do this live on the air, so you guys just bear with me for a second. Here is the Greer image. Okay. All right. There it is. And uh, so <clears throat> the image is what looks to be some type of autopsy of something, all right, with a half a dozen or so, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so seven, half a dozen or so medical people standing around the table. I'm assuming they're medical. One, two, it looks like one, two, three, three, maybe four are wearing lab coats, and then another three. Three or four are wearing suits. Okay, so they're standing around this table. And I'm not sure what's going on in this image. And I was excited for it. I'm glad it's posted and, and so forth. I'm looking at it now as I speak to you. Um, it's, uh, it's hard to say what's going on or who or what the body is on the table. There is a table. It looks like the body is skinless, and I know that sounds a little bit gross, but that's what appears to be going on, or badly burned, but I don't know. I don't know. It looks like uh, it's skinless, like they've removed the skin from the body, and uh, it could be anything. You know, the head looks big, but there's something covering the head, so you can't see what's going on there. Um, the legs look long, the arms look kind of short for the body. You can't really tell what's going on with the fingers. The toes look a little bit strange to me. Like it's, it, it, I, I don't know. Again, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the image is too distorted and this is a photograph of the photograph. So this isn't the original, um, but there's something going on with the feet. I've, I've, uh, enlarged it the best that I can, but it's uh, it's not very clear. It's an interesting image. Now, it could be anything. It could be human. It could be something else. Uh, it could be 
Well, I don't think it's like a gorilla. I don't think it's, you know, a primate, not with the legs, but uh, it's, uh, it's definitely interesting. But now that it's out there in the public domain, maybe somebody can identify who was in the picture, where it was taken, when it was taken, and what is the body on the table. So I posted it out there on Twitter. You guys can take a look at it. And uh, you let me know what you think, okay? All right, there you go. And uh, I'm just doing my part. The thing is, uh, with anything like this, there's too many smart people in this community, way too many. And you are able to look at this and figure things out. Okay, so I know that that's going to happen, and I look forward to everybody's analysis. I don't know what's in the picture. I, uh, I think uh, jumping to alien is a huge leap. But then again, you never know. Okay, so there's that part. I don't know the provenance, uh, the the chain of custody. I don't know any of this information. But uh, we have a lot of smart people in this community, and it will uh, quickly uh, get uh, picked apart, and we'll figure out what's going on. Okay, so I've got it up there on Twitter. I want to know what everybody thinks. Okay, moving on. Breaking news. Israeli and Canadian researchers say they have uncovered evidence The prehistoric inhabitants of a South African cave were fashioning stone tools nearly two million years ago, making the cave one of the world's oldest homes. The discovery was made in Wonderwork Cave, and work is W-E-R-K. Wonderwork Cave, a well-known archaeological site located in southern Africa's Kalahari Desert. Researchers have been excavating the cave for years, and a group of geologists and archaeologists from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and the University of Toronto say they have found the earliest evidence of human activity in the underground chamber, whose African's name means miracle. According to the archaeologist, the cave has housed simple stone tools dating back 1.8 million years. And they also found evidence that fires had been lit there over a million years ago. Absolutely extraordinary. Now, Tumblr Ridge. Google it. Tumblr Ridge, a small Canadian town, lost internet for 36 hours over the weekend after local beavers gnawed through fiber cables while hunting for materials to build their dam. The beavers, the beavers had to chew through a four and a half inch protective layer to reach the cables. Tumblr Ridge, a town in northeastern British Columbia with a population of almost 2,000 people, and the beavers (laughs) chewed through the underground cables at multiple points, cutting internet service for 900 people and cable TV for 60. The outage started at 4 a.m. on Saturday. Local cell phone service was also disrupted. But the good news, the Beavers did complete the construction of their new super strong waterproofed dam. There you go. Let's get the show cracking. Happy birthday to today, Channing Tatum. I said it. Channing Channing Tatum today is 41 years old. Kevin James used to be funny. Today, Kevin James is 56. I used to be funny, too. Jet Li is 58. Carol Burnett is 88. Slipknot stickman Joey Jordison is 46. Producer-songwriter Giorgio Moroder is 71. Take my breath away. Gary Wright is 78. Of course, you know the song Dreamweaver. Singer John Karabi is 62. Man, I remember when he was in the band Scream. Of course, he went on to Motley Crue for about four years and was also in the Dead Daisies. Uh, Duran Duran drummer Roger Taylor today is 61. Our dead guy's birthday today is Doug Sachs. 1936 to 2015, died at the age of 78. Doug was an American mastering engineer from right here in Los Angeles, California. He mastered some of the greatest recordings in history and worked with the best, including The Doors, Pink Floyd, Frank Zappa, The Rolling Stones, The Who, Sticks, Chicago, Jackson Brown, Neil Diamond, Supertramp, Whitney Houston, Rod Stewart, Miles Davis. 
Huey Lewis in the news, Willie Nelson, James Taylor, Tina Turner, Leonard Cohen, Jewel, Stevie Nicks, Sting. Too many to list, by the way. But his last project was Shadows in the Night by Bob Dylan. Doug died on April 2nd, 2015 at the age of 78 from cancer right here in Los Angeles. On this day in history, OTD, 1986, the world's most worst, worstest nuclear power plant accident occurs at the Chernobyl nuclear power station in the Soviet Union. Fader fact. All right, here you go. This is, out of all of my fader facts, I should put a fader fact book together. That's my book. That's the book I need to write, fader facts. Yeah, because I think I've got almost 2,000 at this point. Fader fact. In 2003, Daryl M. Blocker, a CIA intelligence officer working undercover in Uganda, became a celebrity as the lead singer of a popular band known as the Kampala Jazz All-Stars. I'm not making this up. All while working as a spook. Singer, tailor, soldier, spy. There, I'm just saying. I said it. <laughs> That's your fact. Daryl M. M. Blocker. Look it up. Look it up. Rumor has it he did a really good Bob Marley. All right. Tonight... Very special guest, Mike Ricksecker, is here. We're discussing his new book. It is called A Walk in the Shadows. Shadow People is the subject tonight. Tomorrow night, Micah Hanks of The Debrief joins us. Wednesday night, Richard Dolan is back with us. Thursday is another fader night with open lines all night long. All right. Now, it's time for me to hit this River Moon coffee. Mm. rivermoonwellness.com yeah if if jimmy wins the lottery i picture him sitting in a room full of skulls rocking back and forth saying my precious yes i'm doing that now what are you talking about what are you talking about i've got i've got i've got lots of precious over there i do my precious <laughs> River Moon Coffee, promo code F2B blend, 15% off of your order today. It is the best coffee in the world. Man, they go to this little island out there in the Pacific. They go up to the top of the mountain and and get the real free trade coffee beans. They collect those, bring them back to the United States. That's why it's so good. This isn't some mass grown coffee on some big corporate plantation no there's a reason why it's this good mm. i don't know how they do it all right <clears throat> boltzmann boltzmann's boltzmann brain boltzmann's brain b-o-l T Z M A double N Boltzmann. Such an amazing thought experiment for the student and teacher of physics. And I have to admit it that I'm still trying to wrap my tiny little brain around it. But each day I understand a little more about it. Boltzmann's brain. The argument. Basically, Basically, it goes like this. Given enough time, particles will randomly combine out there in the vacuum of space. And one day in the far future, a brain will appear with a full memory of a lifetime pre-installed. Kind of like Microsoft Windows. That's right. Named after Ludwig Boltzmann, who way back in 1896, write that down, was arguing that our universe was more relaxed than what many in science were thinking at that time. And yes, it, it comes down to entropy and thermodynamics. 
And that's a very heavy subject. But Ludwig believed that we were in a state of thermodynamic equilibrium. And in this blissful void, the Boltzmann brain argument suggests that over an extremely large but not infinite right amount of time, by sheer chance, atoms in a void could spontaneously come together in such a way as to assemble a functioning human brain. Like any brain in such circumstances, as you can imagine, it would almost immediately stop functioning and begin to deteriorate. Remember, it's also very cold out there. But theoretically, a Boltzmann brain can also form, albeit again with a tiny probability, at any time of our universe. The consensus amongst cosmetologists today is that there must be some yet-to-be-revealed error in the math, right? Because the surprising calculations are that Boltzmann brains should vastly outnumber normal human brains. Now, chew on that for a second. Even, even Brian Greene has stated, and I'm quoting uh, Brian right now, quote, I am confident that I am not a Boltzmann brain. However, we want our theories to similarly concur that we are not Boltzmann brains, but so far it has proved surprisingly difficult for them to do so, end quote. That's right. Think about this. It all started out as a thought experiment to work out some issues, ideas, and theories of physics among some colleagues. And it has turned into a serious debate and even more serious math. Now, it all comes down to entropy. One of my favorite words and something that I've covered at great length on this show many times before. But as the debate has continued over the years about the Boltzmann brain argument, the one thing that nobody has considered is that we have to survive to be able to experience probabilities over vast periods of time. And I'm excited about that, but we have to survive. Over the last 25 years or so, entropy is playing out much faster than anyone could have imagined. Remember, entropy, the definition, entropy is the lack of order or predictability. It's a gradual decline into disorder. You start out simple, it ends complex, and comes apart. Okay? That's entropy. Now, our society, our world, was very, very simple 25 years ago. And I know it doesn't seem that way, but if you think about it, 25 years ago, no cell phones, no internet, <laughs> at least not like today, no social media, right? You had America Online, that was social media, right? Today, the complex nature of computers, servers, and the entire world being tied and dependent to it could implode at any moment. One day not so long ago, we had a simple dial-up modem and we logged on to America Online. Remember that? Buddy, buddy list? That was it. Today, all of our farming, our food, electricity, news, money, banking, logistics, trucks, deliveries, planes, military, communications, entertainment, everything, all of it, every facet of our daily life depends on the net. There are no exceptions. None. So, as the universe expands, where entropy one day will show itself in some grand, glorious fashion, taking billions or trillions of years, our planet Earth may implode any day in a very short 125-year cycle. We've had about 100 years of bliss. That's right, since electricity became a thing. But now it may be time for the gradual decline 
to disorder. In the end, entropy always wins. Maybe there is something to moving to the mountains and growing your own food. <laughs> right? <laughs> no internet. No connections to the modern world around us. You know, where you can watch <laughs> from your front porch, you know, as the cities dive into total chaos in the valley below. Seriously, I'm just saying. If, if you just take a moment to think about the banking system, Wall Street, the computers, the software that is involved with that, it is the deepest, craziest thing ever, and nobody knows what's going on. Nobody. Nobody. There's no supreme leader, some, some coder, some engineer that understands. No. It's layers of patches and fixes and old computers and new computers. And they, somehow the system just works. And it's the same thing with satellites and communication and, and networking and the news and our entertainment and how it is fed to us every day. It is nothing but layers of patchwork. It's gotten so complex so quickly, it's entropy showing itself right in front of us. And if it comes unraveled just a little bit, something pulls on that thread, it's all going to come undone. That's entropy. And that's why I'm saying we need to survive this so we can observe a probability, a miracle, something crazy in the future. A Boltzmann brain. Think about that. This is fate to lie. I love physics. I do. I love physics. And there is something to everything. When we talk about the world of physics and we talk about the world of science and what they are suggesting to us today, and I repeat myself constantly on this, it's, it's the multiverse, it's entanglement, it's parallel worlds, it's multiple dimensions, on and on. What the world of physics is, is telling us, where the math is leading us, and then we have shadow people. We have UFOs, we have the afterlife, we have NDEs, we have ghosts. All of this is related. Think about that. And I want to get to the other side of this because it's all about to connect. It's connecting now. I am your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Block. We're going to be discussing this and much more tonight with Mike Ricksucker. He's going to be here right after this short break. Tomorrow night, Micah Hanks of The Debrief joins us. It's going to be a great conversation always amazing when Micah is with us. And then, of course, Wednesday night, Richard Bleepin Dolan back with us. Thursday's another fader night with open lines all night long. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'll be right back after this short break. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet. Stay with us. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you-know-who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. With wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day as an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. 
artisan, small batch roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic, all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. rivermooncoffee.com This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. KGRARadio.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, folks. It's trembling times, and fear is pushing emotions, which in turn pushes health the wrong direction. Do you ever get an ache because life is uneasy? Try Life Change Tea at GetTheTea.com. Life Change Tea works on your digestive tract, helping to move food through quicker and comfortably so your health is spot on. Life Change Tea may not help with world issues, but it will help with your digestive issues. A glass a day helps keep the intruders away. So, change your life today. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. If your health game is off, get on by ordering Life Change Tea. GetTheTea.com. And while you're on our site, look around at the great non-GMO organic supplements. And if you're a sales shopper, go to our specials page and see what's for you. I've been drinking the tea for 12 years, and I'm sure glad for its health benefits. Again, that's GetTheTea.com. GetTheTea.com. The tea that makes you go. Fade or not, when you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. The Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Matthew. You're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Mike Ricksecker is here. First time guest. We love that. Tomorrow night, Micah Hanks of The Debrief joins us. Wednesday night, Richard Bleepin Dolan. Thursday night is another fader night with open lines all night long. Tonight, Mick, uh, Mick, <laughs> Mike, Mike Ricksecker joins us for the first time, and we're going to discuss his latest book, A Walk in the Shadows. I'm now in my second read-through on the book, which studies what shadow people may be and if there is an alien or ET component to them. It's a great read. I suggest everybody just go to Mike's website, MikeRicksecker.com, and, of course, HauntedRoadMedia.com. The links are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Mike is the author of the best-selling book, of course, A Walk in the Shadows, a complete guide to shadow people in the historic paranormal books, Ghost of Maryland, Ghost and Legends of Oklahoma, Campfire Tales, Midwest, Ghost Story and Case Files, and the Encounters with the Paranormal series. He has appeared on multiple television shows and programs as a paranormal historian, including 
Travel Channel's The Alaska Triangle. I watch that. Discovery Plus's Fright Club. I watch that too. Animal Planet's The Haunted. I loved it. <laughs> Bio Channel's My Ghost Story. And Ren TV out of Russia, Mysteries of Mankind. He produces his own internet paranormal shows. He's right here on KGRA with us too as well on the Haunted Road Media YouTube channel. And is the producer and director of the upcoming Amazon docuseries, the Shadow Dimension. I would like to welcome, for the first time to Fade to Black, Mike Ricksucker. It, Mike, it's now Mick. Mick. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, you you got to love, love live radio. Welcome to the program. And, uh, Mike, before we get started, you get the first-time guest disclaimer. Yeah. You ready? I'm, I'm ready. I just had a little a little glitch here. On wow, my that side was cool. Talking. Wow, that, that was, was really weird. That was uh, how many cameras you got going on in there, man? Okay, so uh, yeah, right. Okay, Mike, settle down. <laughs> oh man. Okay, uh, the disclaimer. It's uh, just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends, and where the conversation starts, it starts. Where it ends, it ends. But we're going to end as friends. There you go. You ready? All right. Sounds good. Let's do it. <laughs> and uh, now, uh, this is this is what's interesting. First off, uh, the book is great, and 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 Mike, um, I don't know what's going on there with your video switching system, but uh, this is getting interesting. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure what's going on. Can you hear me at least? Yes, I can hear you. All and right. uh, Mike's got multiple cameras, and he's switching between them all. Um, I kind of like the side. The profile is uh, pretty nice, too, as well. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. I, I am touching nothing, so <laughs> I do apologize. Well, see, it this seems is like as soon as as soon as I started talking, boom, it just went crazy. Well, see, this is the deal. This is what the paranormal and supernatural is all about right now. I mean, this is great. <laughs> I used to um, in years past when I was in sports casting. I never had any issues with audio, computers, video, nothing. Just flawless. You get into this, you know, whatever it is, conspiracy, the paranormal, supernatural, and and just issues start. So there you go. I'm not going to watch. <laughs> now I got the profile shot. I'm just going to try it this way. I'm turning off the uh, my primary and just going with the side view. Okay, there you go. Okay. Um uh, yeah, that was that was pretty cool. I got you in green. I had you in in red for a minute. <laughs> so anyway, here we go. Uh, that's that's what live radio is all about. Um, the book, um, when it comes to, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna start where I need, where I want to start. The book scared the crap out of me. Okay, and and it it and 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 it did that because of. The way that it's written, and you've got all of these uh, first-person accounts in the book, but it's also shadow people. And there is so much to uh, what shadow people are and and things, but it's also something that uh, frightens all of us, right? And it's, 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 it's reality. And here we go, because I've had my own experiences, too, uh, as well. Did you when, you, when you write the book... Um, do you realize that it's going to have that effect on people like myself where, you know, they, they may get frightened? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting effect. Uh, you know, what I've heard from a lot of people that have contacted me about the book, I mean, many people have had these types of experiences. They get frightened. People fear what they don't understand. And I think for a lot of people, it, answer some questions. Of course, it does pose a lot more questions as well, because we truly don't know for certain what these things actually are. So the, the book poses a lot of different theories, but I think it helps to you know, give people ideas of what those things may be. And also, I believe it helps people to realize that there are others out there who have had these similar experiences and they're not alone in this. And including yourself, you have your own personal experiences in the book. And also there is uh, some video and things that were tied to it. And I did go and watch the videos. And by the way, uh, I don't want to get ahead of our skis, but the video of the gymnasium 
right when you were panning the camera across. I was like, "Holy crap! What? What? What?" And and um, I don't want to get ahead of our skis, but let's talk about that moment for a second because for me, I saw the shadow being. You kind of panned past it a couple of times and didn't comment. Um, did you know what was going on in front of you? Yeah, what's interesting about that is I I didn't see that with my eyes as I was panning the camera. There's you know, that backlight is kind of in your face and right, right. kind of trying to look over the camera. So I really didn't see that with my eyes at the time. It was in review later on that I actually saw it. Now, what was going on in that moment, we had had a lot of back and forth across that gymnasium where – uh, the doors over by where the shadow person was actually walking, mm -hmm. that's a pretty active area. Uh, we had always heard a lot of noises over there. Uh, there were things going on down the stairs. But beyond the doors there, there's the boys' locker room, the stairs that go down to the basement. We always got a lot of activity over there. And it was always kind of playful. So we'd go over there by those doors, check things out, and then all of a sudden we'd hear things back by the bleachers. And so we'd go over to the bleachers and check out what was going on over there. And all of a sudden it's back over by the door. So there is this playful back and forth, back and forth constantly. And I got lucky in that the one time we were over there by the bleachers, I was painting the camera and captured it. And you can actually see a little bit of a walk to it as you well, can. which is you can. really fascinating. You absolutely can. And this was, this was my point. Um, I'm watching it, and I have my own personal holy crap moment because I'm watching it. But you're all calm, cool, and collected, right? You didn't react, and I thought, it's, what, 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 what? He's not seeing this, and that was uh, that was extraordinary. And you could see the motion, and uh, and it looked pretty tall too, as well. It wasn't it wasn't something small like a little goblin dude or anything like that. It was. A pretty good sized uh, entity, or whatever you want to call it. That was a de it was a decent sized one. Uh, some people report seeing them six, seven, eight feet tall. Uh, this one, we actually did a height comparison later on. Uh, we went back to the location, and it actually seemed a little, you know, maybe a, a childlike, maybe about you know, ten, eleven, twelve years old as far as the height. But it it certainly wasn't, you know, very short because we've seen them before where they've they're only maybe three feet tall. So this one was a little bit taller. Now, um, you start off um, in the book uh, with your own experience. And uh, at eight or nine years old, I actually want to talk about that because and the way that you write about it in the book, it's very personal. And um, in, in the beginning of the book, you mention it and then later on you actually go you know pretty detailed into this experience um when you're going to be at the ufo megacon in laughlin nevada are you going to be talking about your own personal experiences uh, this is a ufo conference are you going to swing this over into how you end the book you know is there a possibility of of the alien et uh connection yeah, absolutely. I will. Uh, you know, all these all these different things are are connected. Mm -hmm. And while yes, the premise is you know our shadow entities, extraterrestrials, or at least are some of them extraterrestrials. I I do, or I am going to break it down in into the ideas of okay, here are all the different types of shadow entities. Here's what we know about them so far. Here are some different experiences. I always like to give people a little bit of background on myself anyway, as, as far as how I got into all of this research. And yeah, that was definitely a very, very personal experience. And you know, I am glad that you brought it up because yes, at the beginning, I kind of briefly give you the summation of what happened. And then toward the end of the book, when we get into, you know, the darker, the dark, and they evil and in that sort of thing, which is a question people have, are all of these things evil? Uh, I really break down that moment so that you can see, okay, was this thing actually being malicious? And as an adult now, it's very different when I was a child, but as an adult now, I really do have to question whether or not it, it was malicious. But I do think, you know, it has a lot of uh, similarities to what people report as far, you know, like abductees. You know, some of those stories, it has some similar uh, connotations 
to those reports as well. Yeah, it, it, it really does. And your, I mean, look, this is the thing that pulls at all of us emotionally is these stories, uh, not only uh, like EVPs, you know, with a child's voice on it, we all react a certain way to that. And then there's the other part where it's an experience of a child that, I mean, it just, we're emotionally connected to that. And what happened to you had to have been something that just stayed with you for your entire life. Take us through that night. Um, uh, it is, uh, I'm gonna, I don't want to do a spoiler alert here, but I am a little bit. It's the end of the experience to me that was the craziest. And that was going into the closet. Right. I mean, that was like, <laughs> it was pretty bizarre. That, that, that's bizarre. <laughs> I, I can imagine that you never opened up that closet door ever again. And, you know, you got to walk down that hallway. Okay. So, um, what happened? You're eight or nine years old. Yeah. I was uh, about eight or nine years old, woke up in the middle of the night, and I saw this tall, dark figure standing in the corner of my room. Uh, of course, I had no idea at the time of shadow people or shadow entities or anything like that. You know, I thought that there was an intruder in my room and it was about to kill me because, of course, you know, that's about what you think at the, the age of eight. But uh, I'm still alive to tell the tale, which is fantastic. Uh, so I figured, you know, I had maybe about enough time to gasp and that was going to be it. I was going to be a goner. Um, but what it did was even, I think, more bizarre. Uh, this thing came up to my bed. Now I'm trying to scream. My mouth opens up. Nothing's coming out. And it leans over. I'm looking up into this blank face. There's no eyes, no nose, no mouth, nothing. And it grabs me by the wrists, crosses my arms across my body, and then runs off down the hall and, like you said, Jimmy, into a closet. Um, I finally found my voice, found my legs, ran off to my parents' bedroom screaming. You know, they were you know, great parents there. Well, they still are great parents. And, you know, they're trying to calm me down, console me, trying to tell me that I had just had a bad dream, but, you know, I had been awake for uh, this whole thing. So, yeah, that was my first significant paranormal experience. And then, of course, it was a very frightening one at that. And the interesting thing uh, that stands out besides running into the closet, which is just a big bowl of wrong, right? <laughs> it's just not cool. <laughs> but uh, placed your arms uh, across your chest. And that, as soon as I, I read that part of, of your experience, Mike, the first thing I thought of, it's like, um, was this like the Grim Reaper, right? Is this is this a a death pose for a casket? You, you know that's what that's what yeah. popped into my head. Yeah, and that's um, you know talking about it more and more. Uh, you know over the years, you know coming on shows like this, I've had people reach out and you know suggest you know, that it seemed to be you know the pose on maybe a, a sarcophagus from Egypt, like with the the crook and flail like that. And so it gets you thinking, okay, well, if they are putting me into some sort of burial pose, uh, you know, maybe they're actually doing something to honor me rather than to do something to harm me. If they think that I'm actually dead and deceased and they're trying to put me into a more reverent position, that would actually be a, uh, a motion of honor. And your experience was physical, right? In that this entity yeah. uh, actually touched you and positioned your arm. So now uh, we're not necessarily, you know, talking about a spirit, or, you know, or something that is intangible. This was a physical experience. Yeah, it was absolutely physical. And people ask me all the time, you know, you know, what did it feel like? Did it feel icy cold? You know, did it feel electric or anything like that? And it's, no, it just, it just felt like any old person, you know, taking me by the wrists and, and crossing them like that. It didn't feel... You know, any different than like, like you. Right, right. And so the journey starts, right? <laughs> the journey starts. <laughs> the journey starts. And um, so let's, let's, let's go with some definitions really quick. Um, and I know this is a broad statement and it's a broad question, 
But what are shadow people? Yeah, and that's the big question, isn't right, it? Right, right. Uh, to, to me, a kind of quote-unquote true shadow person uh, would be an interdimensional being, something that has crossed into our plane of existence from some other plane of existence. But, you know, some of these shadow entities are actually human spirits that can't fully manifest as a uh, as an apparition they only come off as a shadow i know we're going to be talking uh, you know ets here a little bit you know some are extraterrestrial some may actually be time travelers um, i cover very briefly in the book the possibility that they could be uh, you know astral projections again uh, you know just kind of getting a glimpse of a astral projector or even you know some form of a light being that all we're seeing is the uh you know their physical being and so there's a lot of different things that these could actually be could they just be i know i'm simplifying could they just be ghosts yeah sure uh which would which would be a a human spirit um i've talked with a a number of people i've even seen you know, rolling black smoke morph into the apparition of a little girl. So, you know, there, while it wasn't, you know, your your classic, uh, you know, shadow being walking forth and then, you know, turning into the little girl, it was rolling black smoke and it morphed into her. But um, I include a story uh, from my good friend Rob Guttrow, who's a psychic medium, got visited by his aunt because she wanted him to relate a message to his mother, which, of course, was her sister. And she could only appear to him as as a shadow, um, you know, because she had just expended so much energy. She couldn't uh, show up as the apparition. In fact, I just had him on uh, my show, Edge of the Rabbit Hole, here about I don't know, a month, month and a half ago, talking about shadow pets. And he also has an interesting story in which one of his uh, deceased dogs had appeared there in their house as half shadow, half apparition, which is really interesting. Now, uh, there are many, okay, this is what I enjoyed about the book. And as I'm looking at the clock, I'm going to try to get all of this in before the top of the hour. What is great about the book is it's comprehensive and it's detailed and you don't really leave a stone unturned with classifications and definitions and, and, and the phenomena itself. The other half of the book which is I find extraordinary is you've got a huge amount. It's not small. You've got a huge amount of first person accounts and, and their stories one after another. Um, and I didn't find them repeating, which said to me, I mean, the experiences themselves, there are things that are similar, but each story from these individuals was uh, completely different. And I found that so compelling and then we start to get into these classification or types, right? Um, and and I guess the generalized idea here would be most of them are human shaped, right? Are we just going to go humanoid, like uh, in overall? Yeah, you know, uh, most of them are a uh, you know a type of human shape. You know, whether it's you know a full human body, or you know maybe they're a bit translucent, or you might even see half of them. Some are wearing you know the hats and yeah, we're going to get into that. Yes. Like that. Yeah. yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so, but you do have your your mists and wisps and you know, like rolling black smoke, like I was talking about earlier. Um, probably not as much as, of course, the full human figures. So we have, uh, of course, the hat-wearing shadow. Um, and look, I listen to a lot of creepy pasta, and we got the hat-wearing <laughs> shadow dudes right in almost every story, and and I just love them. But how how often do we have the the hat-wearing, the fedora-wearing shadow figure? Yeah, you know what's interesting is I have a lot of people contact me about having seen these hat wearing shadow entities, and I've seen a lot of shadow entities throughout my entire life, and that's one that I have not have not seen the one with the hat, which is uh, to me very ironic. But uh, yeah, I want yeah, the, a lot of people. I want the fedora dude. I do. I want yeah, the, I want, exactly. I want the fedora guy, the hat man, um, and then we have, uh, of course, the crawler. Yeah, the crawler's definitely extremely creepy. I've actually witnessed that one, and that was, you know, there's not too much that spooks me going, 
out on a lot of these investigations, but that one was a bit nerve wracking how it just slipped in there. You're seeing this, you know, this mess of arms and legs and just crawling along, uh, you know, very fast, the, the walls and the ceiling of, of the building. And so, yeah, those are, those are a little creepy. How many times do you get to see, uh, details where you've had descriptions of a face or glowing eyes, or is it generally faceless? Generally, it's faceless. You do get reports of the, usually it would be glowing eyes if you get some sort of facial feature. Uh, the other facial features, you don't really uh, hear too much about. Maybe occasionally, like a little hint of a mouth or, or something like that. But usually it's the, uh, the eyes, if anything, but generally nothing. Now, what about uh, the, what I think is uh, probably one of the more scarier ideas here, you know, is the hooded dude or dudette. You know, uh, the, uh, you know, stalking death, right? That if, if, if you get the hooded figure, you get a wraith or something like that, uh, they've got a job to do. Yeah, a lot of people will will ask me if the hooded figure is like the Grim Reaper. Uh, Grim Reaper's a, a psycho pomp, and uh, he's basically guiding souls into the afterlife. So he's you know he's got no job to do, like you said. Uh, <laughs> but what's what's interesting is I found with the hooded figure, there are some that sure are, are kind of nasty and nefarious, and others that actually seem rather benevolent in nature. I had you know a friend of mine who was at a uh, abbey in you know, abandoned abbey in Ireland she was you know starting to fall down the stairs and there's this you know dark hooded figure that reached out and actually saved her from falling down the stairs you know you're thinking okay that's probably a monk from from the abbey which it probably was now the black wisp this is and your description of it uh, is is also very cool in that it's quick Right, it's fast. Yes, very fast. Yeah, yeah. These are very fast. Uh, when they move, they are you know darting across the room. Uh, my more significant experience with this, and th this kind of leads into the whole you know realm of of these being interdimensional beings. You know, I was at a uh, restaurant called Johnny V's in Muskogee, Oklahoma, doing a paranormal investigation, and I walked into the main doors of the kitchen, and this thing darted across the room so fast. And it slammed into this side door of that kitchen. It was just a flimsy little metal door, uh, you know, just something for waiters and waitresses to carry large trays of food through. You could tap it with your finger and, and this thing would open up and you heard it, bam, slam right into this thing. But the door itself didn't move. And so I'm calling out to others. Hey, did you guys hear that? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we heard that because uh, they were in other parts of, of the building. And for a while, I thought, okay, maybe they were messing with me. They were throwing something at the door. I actually walk out the door, looking around down at the ground. There's nothing. Um, you know, and even if they had thrown something at the door, I would have seen the door move. So, you know, it, that really started me, uh, getting me to question, what in the world did I actually witness here? And I think what had happened was you know, there was some sort of, you know, crossing of, of dimensions or maybe even a time slip here. And, you know, I, I believe that, this thing may have seen me as as a shadow, may have seen me as a ghost, something. But I scared it when I walked in, and when it went flying toward that door, perhaps in its plane of existence, it blew right through that door and into the uh, into the dining room area. But sound working on a different frequency, a different wavelength, I was actually able to hear that cross the dimensions. And so that's one of those things that really sent me down this rabbit hole. The book is A Walk in the Shadows, and you can go uh, both of uh, Mike. Well, Mike's got a lot of links out there, but the two uh, that are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com is MikeRickSucker.com and, of course, HauntedRoadMedia.com. I've got to take a break. Let's get that in right now. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Mike Ricksecker is here. We've got a lot to discuss. The book is an amazing read. We'll be right back after this short break. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. Stay with us. This 
is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one year anniversary. That's right. One year, and as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30-day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation courses, and so much more. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play today and use coupon code 30 days free. That's coupon code 30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull. Or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. Einstein, the ancient crystal skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code JIMMY at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code JIMMY. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Hello, I'm and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on jimmychurchradio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here, repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> We're of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official Fade or Not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright-Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the Lucky Pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black, across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Mike Ricksecker. New name, Mick. <laughs> Mike Ricksecker's with us. 
The new book is uh, A Walk in the Shadows, and uh, it's an amazing read. And I am seriously on my second. I'm going to tell you this, Mike. I, I'm not going to read this in bed at night. No, with a no, no. You <laughs> maybe read, not a good idea. No, you read that during the day with the lights on. Um, but I wanted to mention. Uh, I don't want this to get away from us. Um, there's a fifth beetle um, in this book, and that is the illustrations. The illustrations are extraordinary. Who's the artist? Yeah, the artist is Adam Tillery. Uh, he's a fantastic. I've known him about ten years now, and actually, he and his well, his wife just uh, gave birth to their first child today. So, uh, right on. Happy you brought. I'm happy you brought him up because uh, congratulations, Adam and Hannah. Wow! Wow! That's you know that's the universe, man. That's the universe. I, I literally wrote down here. I'll hold it up for you. Right. It was, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I wanted to bring that up because uh, that is a big part of the book and it really uh, carries things along really well done. The artwork is incredible and the photographs, too. Um, OK, let's uh, let's take this to I want to start with. Oh, um, uh, there are. All of these individual uh, first-hand accounts and stories, way too many to go through tonight. I do want to take the opportunity for you to uh, walk us through a couple of your favorite um, uh, experiences in the book with some of these individuals. But I want to start with um, uh, the shadow of uh, Campsville Grade School, which uh, is what we were talking about earlier. Um, what makes this grade school so haunted? If it's, I mean, yeah. even if it is haunted, I mean, it, it, that may be the wrong uh, terminology. Yeah, you know, there's a, a lot of things that go on there. You know, not just the the shadow entity, but you know, there are footsteps that, that you hear all the time within there, coming from a second floor that doesn't exist. It's a it's a little one floor grade school out in the middle of uh, nowhere in Illinois, and we are constantly hearing these footsteps. Uh, from the uh, basically from the ceiling, you go up there. It's just it, it, there's an attic. There's no floor up there. Uh, it's just you know insulation and all kinds of other things that we were getting there. But what really to me gives it that energy that makes a supernatural activity happen there is the fact that this school is actually built on an old archaeological dig site. In fact, you can. Just you can see the terracing still in the hillside from those digs back in the 1920s, and they in the 1930s they put the school right on top of it and what they were digging up, and that area uh, is still rife with uh, with archaeological dig sites. Uh, they're they're digging up old Native American artifacts there, and so you know. Once you start digging into old Native American sites and you put buildings on top of it, you get a lot of this type of activity at those types of buildings. Uh, we've all seen that movie, right? <laughs> we've yeah. all seen that movie. And I don't know who decides to build a, a, a school on top of a, an indigenous uh, site like that, but you are going to get stuff. Um, but how do you get, um, and this happens, I, I watched... Uh, uh, a couple of the videos from the school and how do you get footsteps from the second floor? I know you just said there's an attic up there, but how do you get footsteps from a second floor if there isn't one or is it, is the building itself is the school itself? Uh, what's the word I want to say? Ghost. Like, was there another building there before the school that could have been two or three stories tall? Yeah, that's something that we tried to research and, and look up as to whether or not there was another building that was on that particular site. There was another little high school that was adjacent to it, but not on the exact uh, same location as the grade school. Uh, so what we ended up deducing, and we can only really speculate, you know, because there were not only the Native Americans that were there, but there were, you know, early pioneer settlers to the area. And we really don't know where a lot of those original buildings were, but with the school itself being put into a dig site, it is naturally lower than where the hill originally was. So there may have been some sort of building on top of that hill originally, and then as they dug into it, it lowered the footprint, of course, of the school itself. So if there had been some sort of building there, its 
floor would have been you know, about the height of the ceiling of that school now. Um, I want to get into the uh, interdimensional aspects of this. And one of the points that you make, I, I, I want to get, we're going to dovetail this into the mist um, because your experience with the mist is, is, is pretty cool. It's pretty scary actually. And uh, I want to get into that, but then you, you pr go pretty solidly into a term that isn't talked about enough, which is ultra terrestrials. So I want to start with the definition because as we continue the conversation, we're going to come back to this. What is an ultra terrestrial? Yeah, ultra terrestrial. And this was, you know, part of a conversation that I had with my good friend, Carl Johnson, who's a, a demonologist. And, you know, this is really, you know, we think of extraterrestrial as, you know, a, you know, a life form from outside of our planet, but an ultra terrestrial, more of a being that is here with us, but from some other dimension that is now occupying our space as well. So uh, a little bit, a little bit outside the box. Are they are they here to? Not all of the stories. Okay, I want to be clear here. Not all the stories are frightening, and not all of them are malevolent. Um, and so, as you read through the book, you kind of go, "Hmm," a little bit. Are they here to help us? Are they here to harm us? Are they here to scare us? You know what? What ultimately is the agenda? Because the book goes both ways. It it does because I I think each shadow entity has their own agenda now whether they're a part of a group that has an agenda or doing something on their own you know that's something that takes you know additional research and investigation to try to figure out but yeah you're right there are some that sure they're up to no good they're mean nasty nefarious and and Sure, you can use the word evil. And there are others that come along and are rather benevolent in nature. So it's a mix of both. And trying to, it, you can't just have one experience with a shadow entity and, and, and just put a stamp on it. You know, this was a shadow entity. It, you know, it, it's malevolent, whatever. Uh, it, it takes a lot more trying to deduce and figure out what that is. Because a lot of times what happens is somebody sees a shadow it's dark. You know, usually it is a darker setting. And pe people see them during the day, too. But a lot of times they see them in a, a, a nighttime setting. We fear it. We don't understand. So, therefore, we automatically deduce it's dark. It must be evil, etc. But a lot of times people just, when they witness these things, they're just observing and watching. Which, okay, you might be invading their space a little bit because they were not invited in. But what were they really doing besides watching? Well, and it, it it kind of goes both ways. Maybe we're invading their space, right? I mean, well, and it could it could be. You know, I I do postulate that at at uh, some point in the book that, you know, if these are interdimensional beings that have been here long since before humanity, then perhaps you know we are the invaders to their territory. Yeah, they show up, and you and I are there. They're like, "What are you guys doing here?" Right. <laughs> so, yeah. what, wait, what are you doing here? And uh, it's an accidental startle, right? Where th this interdimensionality aspect comes into this, where w both sides are coming into focus when normally maybe they don't see us, right? They're in their world. We normally don't see them. We are in our world. But then they suddenly uh, cross over and we're able to see each other for these brief moments. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of times what's what's happening here, and I, I get a little bit into time within the book. Uh, there'll be other, uh, other books that I write that get a little bit more, uh, that get deeper into this. But, you know, I believe that time is working concurrently, past, present, future. And if you take a certain location like where I'm sitting right, right now or where you're sitting, uh, Jimmy, and you just kind of stack up every single moment that has happened, is happening, and will happen, you know, you end up with this large – I call it stack time theory. It's really – and doing a lot of research later on, you know, discover that, oh, well, Einstein was talking about a lot of this in his space-time continuum. But in any case – uh, I believe what happens sometimes is there's two moments in that stack that 
for whatever reason we don't know, suddenly are resonating at the same frequency. And so we end up with these blending of dimensions where we see these different time slips. And that could be where some of these shadow entities are coming from is that we're suddenly, you know, we're able to see them. They're able to see us for a brief moment because of this, you know, vibration, this frequency, this frequency change to, you know, just for a brief moment at the exact same rate. Now, um, in Tanya's, uh, uh, she's actually um, uh, in the book uh, in a couple of spots, but Tanya's story, um, we're, we're going to be talking about ETs and aliens tonight and, and, and fold this over into the men in black, which I find very interesting. And in Tanya's uh, encounter, um, she describes no facial features. I believe you can correct me um, if I'm wrong, but that her experience, the person did appear to have uh, a hat, maybe even a top hat, but a cape or, or a coat, which said to me, men in black, you know, and it come you know, later uh, when, when men in black got popularized, the first versions of men in black were shadow people. And a lot of people don't know that part of uh, the history. And we're going to get into that. But tell us about Tanya and what, what she saw. It really sets the tone for the book. Yeah, yeah. With Tanya, um, like you were saying, you know, she had witnessed this, uh, this shadow entity uh, in her room, was wearing the top hat. You know, again, no facial features, was wearing what seemed like a cape. Uh, she had discovered that the house there had once been One-Eyed Jack's mortuary. So, you know, she had to ask herself, you know, was this actually One-Eyed Jack? So it kind of, you know, starts making you question, okay, are these things humans? Was it the mortician from way back in the day? Or like you said, Jimmy, was this an actual Man in Black episode? You, you start getting that because with these hat wearing entities they wear all kinds of different hats whether it's the top hat or the fedora i've heard ones of wearing a uh one with an archer hat which is really bizarre a wide brim hat so they wear a lot of these different things uh and we don't necessarily know why but uh, hers was interesting it was like the full regalia with the top hat and the cape and then we uh let's let's jump over to albert bender because um, that's a story, you know, when it comes to ufology, we, we all know about Albert Bender and, and the men in black and his encounter and how he, how he walked away and then came back later in life and recounting the story again. But, um, his, well, okay. Who was Albert Bender? I'll let you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Albert K. Bender. And I will be talking a bit about this at the Laughlin UFO uh, mega conference, uh, cause his story is fascinating. And so for those that don't know Albert K. Bender, because his story takes ba place back in the 1950s, uh, during the big UFO flap 1952, he started the, uh, international flying Sauc saucer bureau. And, you know, it became very prolific. They ended up with divisions, offices uh, you know, across the globe. And he was, you know, producing these new newsletters, having these different meetings and you know, people reporting all this different activity. They're trying to make sense of what's going on. And as this organization began to grow, he started uh, becoming visited by these different entities and the way he described it was these uh three dark figures materializing into his room you know they you know, were wearing the hats uh, they had glowing eyes and when i first heard this story i'm not thinking even though i'd heard of men in black of course uh i'm not thinking men in black and i'm not thinking extraterrestrials which is what he thought they were my brain immediately went to shadow people because i've heard so many stories about these shadow entities looking exactly like that so uh it it does cause me to question okay men in black extraterrestrials hat wearing shadow entities are these all one in the same thing and he can he be credited with coining the term men in uh, black I think, that would, I, I think that would be gray barker actually because uh gray barker when he uh I can't remember the title, the name of the, his book. It came out in the 1950s. He cited uh, Albert K. Bender's story within his book 
Um, and I believe he's the one that actually called them men in black. And then Albert K. Bender finally uh, published his book in the early 60s to explain the entire story. Now, and, and this is what is so interesting uh, about what happened to Albert in that these entities show up uh, and we get full detail from Albert many years later, but this was in the early 50s. And they show up and they warn him about the UFO subject, right? So it, shadow people, yes. Men in black, yes. Possibly all these are possible. But they are telling him to, to, to get off the UFO subject. That is pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. They, they basically threatened him. Now, what's interesting is they actually um, showed him some, uh, some additional details. And I don't include this part in my brief section on Albert K. Bender in my book. But they actually uh, you know, showed him some of the different things that, that they were doing. Uh, but yeah, they they warned him off of actually reporting the activity, and so he did stop for a good ten years. Ten years. I mean, they scared the crap out of him, right? And and uh, th did this is this the progenitor of uh, the method of operation of Men in Black, right? The way that Albert uh, described it uh, later in in I think his book came out in 1960. Uh, but what happened in 1952, 1953 with him, with these three men in black, pretty much spelled out everything that happened after that. Yeah, you started hearing a lot more of the men in black stories. Now, there were men in black stories uh, prior uh, to that time, but it just seemed like once... Once Gray Barker uh, came out with his book, started reporting, you know, more of this activity, it became more wide known. You started hearing more and more of these stories about the Men in Black, and of course, people also question, okay, are are Men in Black you know, part of some shadowy government organization? There's that too, <laughs> and I know for a fact that they exist, having you know, spent a little time at, at NSA, so they do exist. Um, but you know, we're talking about something else other than. Uh, actual government agents. Hey, you just, okay, you said it. I didn't want to bring this up, <laughs> but you just slipped. <laughs> yeah, I think I did, yeah. <laughs> uh, did you say a uh, little time at the NSA? I, I did spend a little time at NSA, yes. You know, you uh, look spookish, by the way. I'm just going <laughs> to let you know. Uh, what'd you do for the NSA? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I did for them pretty much what uh, what I do now. I, I work in the uh, computer industry, and so that's I was basically supporting the spies there. <laughs> <laughs> so, but but I got to see I got to see what goes on. I only spent uh, like a couple years there, and um, it was definitely interesting. It's a whole different world there, and. Um, I'd tell you more, Jimmy, but then I'd have to kill you. Buddy. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> you know, everybody just leaned forward. What? What did did he say? Uh, yes, he did. Um, I would like to know at some point more more about that. And uh, do you think do you think that your employers are aware of not only like this show, but the things that you talk about? You know, are are they interested in in any of this? Well, you know, my current employer, uh, yeah, you know, some of the people that I work with and uh, work for have taken an interest in this. There was uh, one employer that I worked with uh, or worked for several years ago that uh, you know, they were doing lunch and learn sessions. You know, sit down, you know, bring a bag lunch and we'll go over some technology that's in the shop and, you know, somebody on the team will do the presentation. So it got to be my turn. And so I'm like, okay, what do you guys want me to, you know, do for the, for the lunch and learn? And they're like, oh, we want you to talk about ghosts. Right, right. <laughs> well, and, and so, <laughs> which is cool. But yeah. when when you're when you're hanging out with a bunch of the folks from the NSA, do you ever take the opportunity to just you know weave into the conversation? So what about the UFOs? What do you guys know? Well, uh, well, where, where the where are the UFO files at? Yeah, I, I don't talk to a lot of those guys anymore. That was a good twenty five years ago. Um, but when I was there, uh, it was around the time that uh, Independence Day was out, and so you know my. Uh, my then wife, ex-wife, uh, now <laughs> we're you know we'd watch that movie with some friends, and so yeah, it, was, it piqued my curiosity, of course, and I'd already had an interest anyway. So I'm like, well, 
I'm actually I'm in NSA. Let me do a little poking around. And you know, I have you know, I had a, a top secret security clearance, but you know, those that have been involved with that know that just because you have a top secret clearance, that doesn't open every door for you. Um, there are certain you know compartments. I had a TS SBI clearance in. The, the letters you know mean different compartments but even if you have access to that compartment you still have to have a need to know to actually get into the information and so it was one of those I'm doing a little poking around of and I'm seeing okay yeah there's something going on over here but I couldn't necessarily get into it because you know my function was computer support not you know the intelligence side of it yeah, so uh, search bar NSA database did you ever type in UFO Tell me, come on. I, <laughs> of course I, I, I did. <laughs> uh, we laugh, we kid. What did, and, and what popped up? Did the computer, did you have a couple of guys show up in the office and and say you can no longer search that? You know, what did what, what, you find out? Um, I know, I'm, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm going into a zone that, but, but hey. Yeah, I have to be real careful there. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know how often do I get to a quiz uh, an ex NSA employee? It do doesn't matter how long ago it was. Um, you've, I've got to ask these questions or I'm not doing my job. Right, of course, of course. Um, I, like like I said, I could see that. Okay, there stuff would would come up, but I couldn't necessarily get into it. But. Jimmy, I know you're going to be at there at the uh, the UFO MegaCon, so uh, we'll talk a little offline oh, about man, it. Oh, man, I can't wait. I can't <laughs> wait. Okay, so uh, how do we – oh, you're the one that slipped. Okay, all right. I'm you, the one that slipped, yeah. You, you opened that door. Well, we started talking men in black. And, yeah. you know. <laughs> and, and, and so back to this. So Albert, um, uh, 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 about 10 years later, a decade later, he decides to come clean and do his tell-all – uh, not only 1952, but what went on in his life with the men in black and why he had to, because he was at that point, uh, he was one of the most noted uh, people in ufology. And he, he not only had his organization, but people listened to him. He, he did a lot of speaking and then poof, he disappears. So he comes back and says, hey, you know, the men in black told me I had to stop talking about the UFO subject. And this is why. Yeah, exactly. He, uh, I mean, basically, he was the man. You know, everybody was was looking to him. There, are, uh, tons of people all over the world. You know, uh, UK, Australia. They were jumping on board with this organization, and you know, feeding him all of this information. He's compiling it, putting it all together, and then you know, disseminating it back out. So yeah, Albert K. Bender w was the man there for, you know, a good year and a half, almost two years, and. Yeah, he suddenly went poof, and nobody knew why. Uh, you know, he he gave some information there to to Gray Barker, but um, yeah, he was he was away from the scene, basically, you know, fearing his his own safety because these you know, these entities told him to to stop, or there were going to be uh, consequences, and uh, he he did. He was, um, I guess, he got to the point in which well. They had also told him in one of the conversations. If you if you read his book, it gets like really detailed into uh, the different the different information that they told him because they actually did visit more than than the one time. And so they had, uh, had told him that they were going to be here for about fifteen years. They were harvesting some resources out of uh, the water from our oceans, and then they would be gone. And so I guess it got to the point in which he felt it was safe to be able to talk about it again that they were gone. We need to take our break right here, Mike. So let's get that in. This is Fade to Black. We're going to continue Albert Bender, Men in Black and Shadow People. All of this is going to get tied together into the physics of our world. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. More with Mike after this short break. Stay with us. here we listen to jimmy church you're listening to fade to black always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk jimmy church with fade to black kgra radio.com 
mis amigos, yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. ¡Claro que sí! Do you want to be an official fade or not? Of course you do. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. Just go to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Fade or not. When you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. <laughs> KGRARadio.com You are listening to Fate to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Mike Ricksucker. And uh, before we get back to Mike, I want to talk to you about Virtual Shield. Virtual Shield VPN. It's the only... Everybody needs a VPN today. This is the world that we live in. Uh, we've all seen the bunker. I just posted a picture of uh, the new bunker up on uh, Twitter. You can see how many computers I run here. Everything runs its own VPN. I'm in a secret location. Nobody knows where I'm at until now with Mike Ricksucker and the NSA are closing in quickly, but it's going to be difficult because I have my own VPN. There is a strict no logs policy with Virtual Shield. They have encrypted servers all around the world, hiding you, hiding your data, hiding your search history, everything. And it's all simple to do. Just go to virtualshield.com forward slash fade to black. You can do that. If you don't want to type into your search bar, which I get, click on the link in the video description box below. It'll take you straight there, and you will get Virtual Shield VPN for 50% off today. Do it now. You need your own VPN. There you go. Our guest tonight, Mike Ricksecker. Now, Mike, I want to I want to get back to, um, to uh, Albert Bender for a second because... His experience with the men in black, and we're talking about shadow people, um, they talk to him about UFOs. Okay, we understand that. But it's how they appeared in his home multiple times. They uh, Tell us about that part of it, because that's when you start to think, wait a minute here, uh, the shadow people connection is very obvious. How did they appear in his house? 
Yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting and it, it very strikingly uh, similar to a lot of the the shadow people reports. Uh, you know, the the most distinct times are when they showed up as three entities wearing you know they're very dark in nature they're wearing the the hats basically like a like a fedora uh, and they had these glowing eyes and they would basically materialize into the room and then they would communicate with him telepathically and and those that have these uh, shadow people experiences that actually have them communicate is usually via some sort of telepathy because you know these shadows they don't have mouths they don't have the the facial uh, details um, and what's also interesting, he had most of his experience was with the with the three, um, but he also had a, a brief encounter with just a, a shadow passing through the room, a uh, singular one. And then later on, something that he reported was invisible. So, you know, he's had some other encounters here with things that we normally, you know, say would be paranormal in nature so we're seeing a lot of these similarities between okay what he's reporting as an et experience to what we usually report as a paranormal experience and um there's another part to this which is the mist i want to get into uh entanglement and physics and everything else but i think that everything is connected and your experience with the mist um, and I want to get into that right now. Um, is the mist something that manifests, like going back to Bender? Uh, does the mist uh, turn into uh, a humanoid figure, or does the mist stay? Because I've looked at all of your images, um, and I would think <laughs> I'm almost looking at a humanoid figure sometimes with the mist. So, uh, tell us about your experience. Yeah, I've had I've had a couple of experiences with with the mist, um, and I, I mentioned one of those encounters earlier in that rolling black smoke, which was basically like a mist uh, that morphed into the apparition of a little girl. Uh, another encounter that I had with that was at a uh, a house that we were investigating, where the girls, the adult daughter um, of the family, that she was experiencing what she described as a red-eyed shadow entity uh, that usually showed up in her closet and also appeared other places within was, the was house. Was this it, at the home in Oklahoma? This was at the home in Oklahoma, yeah. Okay, okay. And during one of our investigations, the cat's running around like crazy, and I end up following it. It stopped right in front of her door, I saw why it stopped at the door. It was because there was this giant mist that was right in the middle of the bedroom. And it it ended up dissipating away. But, you know, I always wondered, okay, was this mist trying to form into that shadow entity with the red eyes? Or maybe it had been in the room as a shadow entity with red eyes was dissipating away into that mist and then finally completely gone altogether. It, it's very similar to what Albert uh, described. And I keep going back to this because of his background with UFOs, but this is a noted intellectual, right? <laughs> Having these experiences, and they sound so similar to uh, others, uh, including yourself, the glowing eyes, you know, the manifestation in, in a room. And it goes back to Albert Bender, and, and I think that there may be a UFO connection here. Yeah, there, there certainly could be some sort of uh, UFO connection here. That's what he ended up reporting, of course, you know, with his involvement uh, with the flying saucer, um, you know, flap that they called it uh, back there in the 1950s, and that they were actually telling him, you know, you need to, you know, stop what you're doing with this research. Uh, but then we see in today's society these, these same things happening whether you know they're wearing the hat, whether they have the glowing eyes, very very similar to what he described. And I think if we, uh, you know, go back through throughout time, uh, we'll know we'll notice that you know this is nothing new. You know, this is not something that's just been going on in the last 10, 20 years. You know, it, it goes even further back than than Albert K. Bender. You look into uh, ancient history and you see that they were reporting it back then as well. I remember uh, this was probably eight years ago on the show when I was talking about uh, 
some of the Egyptian um, artwork uh, and carvings on the walls there, and I noted uh, the different colors. And I said, "Wait a minute! You know they they were they were they were carving shadow people." <laughs> and I, yeah, <laughs> and I, I made a big thing about it, and 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 I had so many researchers come back. Well, it's this, 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 and this, and Kemet and Kemetology and black, and there's all of the symbology that is involved there. Okay, that's fine. I'm not educated, but that looks like a shadow person to me. <laughs> I mean, that's what. Oh, by the way, um, here's you at eight years old. I just wanted to show this to you. Oh I, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I had, exactly. I had this here in the bunker, and I. I just wanted to just yeah the crooked <laughs> flail there you go uh, but yeah you're you're right you look at um, some of that artwork and you can see the the shadow entities there um, oh I forget the uh, the name of the uh, the person's tomb but it's one of the tombs there at at Luxor and you see the shadow entity right there on the wall there the bob birds are, are in the uh, depiction as well but there's this shadow person standing right there by a tomb. And uh, the Egyptians had their belief of the seven different parts of the soul. And there were two parts that stayed here on Earth while the other five went off to the constellation of Orion. And one was the Ka, the animating part of uh, of the soul. And then there was the Kabit, or the shadow. And those two were left here to roam. And there are a handful of uh, pieces of artwork in which you can see the depiction of that shadow that is left here on Earth. Now, uh, the the other part of this, where everything starts to come together, is today, we do have physics and science, but there's other phenomena that are happening too at the same time. It's It's the Mandela effect. There seems to be some kind of time slippage going on. We may have parallel worlds colliding. Um, things that are altering, um, but these are suggestions from science and from physics today, which is starting to uh, bring the world of the supernatural and paranormal together. Although physicists and theoretical physicists will will not necessarily go there, but they are strongly suggesting it. And one of the quotes that you have in the book from um, uh, uh, John Barrow who's a theoretical physicist and somebody that I follow for a very long time. This is his quote that you have in the book quote. It has long been recognized that uh, techno technological civilizations only a little more advanced than ours will have the capacity to simulate universes in which self conscious entities can emerge and communicate with one another End quote. <laughs> How much more clear do we need to be? Yeah, exactly. You know, we're we're seeing. Uh, you know, we've been seeing this for a while now with artificial intelligence. Of course, we saw it play out in the movie The Matrix, and there's there's other you know similar you know science fiction uh, you know movies of you know, that that go down the route of, the, of artificial intelligence, and you know we. You know, as far as and we're talking basically living in a simulation, simulated universe. And what's interesting to me about that is, um, is that, you know, basically we've been talking about this for thousands and thousands of years. It's in our religion. They don't call it a simulation, but when religion talks about, you know, whether it's reincarnation, we go off somewhere after we pass away, we come back, we're here to learn something, we pass again, come back, and it's this whole cycle. We keep coming back, coming back. Um, you, other religions talking about we're here preparing to go on somewhere else. We had been somewhere else before. We're here now preparing for something, and we go on. So it's the same concept of a simulation. They just don't call it a simulation in religious texts. And I think, you know, I mean, Barrow's right. You know, there's going to be, you know, a few years down the road, we've seen how fast technology has escalated here in the years, I mean, think about where we were 20 years ago, 40 years ago. We are so far more advanced now, and it's going to keep getting faster and faster. You know, it's um, it, it's just going to be absolutely insane, the technology we're going to see 10 or 20 years from now. And you're already seeing us, you know, integrate with, um, like augmented reality on your phone. I mean, we, we're calling them filters now. You know, it's kind of simplistic. You, you see it on you know, Snapchat or, um, you know, Instagram. You know, th that's just the beginning of where this is going. You're going to have a complete makeover. 
people are you know going to be walking around with the you know VR uh, implementations all the time and seeing an entire different world than what's actual the physical reality and people are going to start to not really be sure okay what's actually real what's the simulations will almost be like a simulation a simulation at that point well you won't know the difference right exactly you, you simply won't know the difference and what what borrow uh, suggests here is if this is indeed the case right where another technically advanced civilization is running some ginormous computer and a simulation and creating your own universe then by default by proxy some of these entities that we are seeing today would be et right i mean that's the only conclusion to come to yeah yeah they would be from you could call them extraterrestrials uh you know if you go back to the if people want to relate to the Matrix movies, these would be almost like the agents, uh, people that are familiar with massively multiplayer online games. It would be like a game master coming into the simulated world. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's it's all of these different type of concepts. And when it comes to shadow entities, is that what we're already seeing? Is this shadow entity a an entity or a, I guess, person or a visage? from that external world that has come down into the simulation to interact. Or again, we see a lot of these are watching and observing, or they may be, you know, taking some sort of readings or making some sort of observations as to how we are interacting within the simulation. Almost uh, another consideration would be like an NPC. Yeah, exactly. A non-player character. Exactly. Uh, not necessarily intelligent, right? <laughs> We've seen right. that before. But something so that you... A, it could just be a bot that's been placed in to gather information. That you interact with. That you can interact with, exactly. And that's a that's a scary... And we always go back to the Matrix and, and talk about how uh, the Matrix is, is, is turned out to be a documentary. Right? It's not necessarily... <laughs> in so many fiction. ways. In so many ways. And, and, and getting into this when um, others like Elon Musk, there are many uh, executives in Silicon Valley in positions of uh, being in the know uh, when it comes to engineering and AI and the possibilities of what computer chips can do. And of course, Nick Bostrom, uh, we'll talk about that more in just a second. But when they talk about the possibility of living in a simulation, you have to consider what what the world is that they are in, right? They they don't they don't really um, they don't question it, and they suggest the possibility is there. That's not crazy talk anymore, is it? No, not at all. And you know, people that are in these high tech fields are already interacting with so many different simulations. I mean, a guy like e Elon Musk with, uh, with SpaceX, I mean, how many times have they run through simulations of, you know, going to the space stations, you know, they're, they're going to be going to Mars. You, you bet they've already, you know, simulated that and how it would work out. And so they're spending a lot of their life in a simulator to try to figure out how we're going to do all this. So, yeah, they have firsthand perspective of how a simulation works. And I, I think because of that, it's kind of put the light bulb on for them. Like, hey, we're actually already in a simulation right now ourselves. Well, when uh, Nick Bostrom started talking about this, um, it seemed like science fiction. He's coming from a position of intelligence. Okay, he's certainly not going to publish this and talk about it unless he had something to back up these theories and ideas. When he started that, which was almost 20 years ago, by the way, this wasn't five years ago, uh, the subject was brought up. Today, it's nearly talked about as fact, the possibility of living in a computer simulation. That's how far we've come. Yeah, uh, and where I included him in the book, he had an interesting I idea there about uh, about shadow people. The way he termed that is, you know, there may be you know some people that are in this world. They're almost like filler, really, which is it's it's kind of you know. 
bad to say, I suppose, but that it's almost like a, a lower. Okay, let me let me try to put it this way. Um, the, the best way that I can relate it is in uh, you know a lot of these online games that they will have, like you were saying before, NPCs, nine-player characters that basically populate the world to kind of flesh it out and make it feel fuller. Uh, but they're not they're not a true player character. You can only interact with it on a very limited level. And so that's what he's actually called uh, shadow people was, which is kind of interesting. And, you know, just his description uh, again, it's like another light bulb going on. Oh, you know, I've interacted with those type of entities within a game world, but is that what's actually going on here as well? And if we if we take this to the next level where uh, we're talking about the science and the physics of it, and then we go to the sleep paralysis nightmare that goes down in your your bedroom and the interaction comes in, is this a situation where physics is suggesting entanglement? Uh, you know, a, a, a parallel world that exists infinite to our left and to our right, right? And different versions of everything. Is is that physics and the paranormal colliding? I I think it is. But what's funny about that is, you know, you could, you could talk to a physicist about entanglement in parallel worlds, but you start talking about paranormal activity <laughs> and shadow people and ghosts, and they don't want to talk about it. But to to me, they're they're related. They're they're all connected to each other. You know, is what we're seeing uh, in our room, if that's where we're seeing it, is that actually a parallel universe that is bleeding through into our world? Because, like you said, you know, with, with entanglement, uh, are these two things you know connecting and having an interaction? Uh, of course, at that same moment with entanglement, they're going to happen at the exact same time. Is that what we're actually seeing play out? Is it, uh, is it, if you were going to, uh, take a gamble here, are we suggesting, uh, the multiverse? Are we going with hard science or are we going to go into something else, uh, extraterrestrial with aliens and ETs and a simulated universe? Which, which way are you going? I mean, I think it's a mix. I, I really do. I mean, I, I know physicists want a nice mathematical equation to, to wrap it all up in a nice bow, and I don't know if they're ever really going to get one. Uh, I do think that there's certainly a, a very strong component of, of quantum physics mixed into this, but um, you know, I, I definitely believe there is an extraterrestrial component with it. I think you know you have that you know, inter, interdimensional component with it as well, and you know the the supernatural. The, when we say the term supernatural, um, you know, Hans Holzer had a great quote. There is no supernatural. Everything that we're observing is natural. Is normal. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a great quote by Hans. Um, but this is, for me, where things get a little uh, iffy and scary at the same time. You were physically touched and you had your hands put across your chest. That's not a world of simulation. That's not what Barrow is suggesting here, that we may be able to interact, but we're, yours was a physical thing. That wasn't an NPC visualization of an augmented reality of a simulated universe. You are now on the physical side. Physics, right, where it is something that can move your your your, your body. You, you know what I mean? So it... It's, yeah. it, it's going in the other direction. Yeah, that one, I mean, that was definitely a, 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 a physical interaction there. And the, the question to me, uh, when it comes down to, again, this is where I think it's a bit of a mix. How did that thing get into my room? And where did it go? It went into, an, into a closet and went where, right? Uh, you know, was there a portal in the closet? I have no idea. Um, so, you know, how did it get there? Uh, to begin with, yes, we ended. I ended up having a physical interaction with this thing. We connected on a physical level, um, but for it to access my room and get there to begin with, and then leave and go somewhere, I, I think that's where we start having, you know, that big question of, 
you know, the crossing, whether it's the crossing of dimensions mm-hmm. or was there some sort of, you know, were they using some sort of, you know, wormhole or, or maybe even a stargate to get there? Because this could have been extraterrestrial. Um, you know, if we go down the, the route of, you know, crook and flail, if this thing was actually from ancient Egypt, I mean, it would be very literal at that point. But, you know, it, it could have been, you know, that that's a possibility that's on the table. Maybe it saw, you know, it pops up into my room. Maybe it traveled there somehow. If it was a time traveler from, you know, 4,000 years ago or whatever shows up in my room, maybe it looks like a tomb to them because they can't kind of comprehend what all these different things are on my wall and, and what have you. Um, you know, so maybe, you know, that was the context it used. Again, this is just a you know, wild speculation, but I, I think we have to put these different possibilities on the table and look at each one. <laughs> Because in 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 Barrows uh, and others and in, in Bostrom, where we're talking about a simulation and and existing there, is the contact only visual, right? I mean, can in a simulated situation, can these entities move something, right, and pick up something or throw something, or is it purely visual? Well, I think you can physically do something, physically interact. If we go back into um, you know, our computer simulations that we have now, or even going into a game environment, if I enter a, a game environment as a as a GM, as a game master, um, even if I a, am invisible uh, game master that the players can't see, I still have depending on how you've programmed the thing, I still should be able to have some ability to move things around within that construct. So um, it, it gets down to what are the actual rules of the simulation. We don't know all of our rules here. How simple of, uh, of a computer, if, if you were going to simulate a universe... We're not talking about necessarily a Dyson sphere and the and the energy of a sun or a star to create this because we have the ability to do this right now on planet Earth without the the power of our sun. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we can put together a simulated universe within. I could probably do it on my laptop here at this point. You know, our our computers have gotten right. that powerful now. Um, but I think when it comes down to you know, something as large as what we are. I think, again, we talk, you know, everything within the universe is connected, and there's been a lot of great research on on this in recent years, but I think it's embedded within us. You know, the the power for this simulation is actually in us. They're, they're actually uh, learning ways now and how to store data within DNA. So if we're actually able to store data within DNA, is that how the knowledge of the universe and how the simulation works, is that how it's embedded? It's actually embedded in our DNA, the DNA in, in animals, the you know the molecular structure of everything. Is that encoded there? It very well could be. Now, uh, we're going to take a break right here, Mike, but a uh, quick yes or no question. We're in a simulation. Are you okay with it? I'm totally fine with that. Yeah. I mean, what's the difference, right? Exactly. I, I, I always go back to that one scene in uh, in The Matrix. I see the steak, right? I see the meat. It is juicy, <laughs> right? Absolutely. What's the difference? What's the difference? Bliss. <laughs> yes, what's the difference? <laughs> this is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Mike Rick Secker is our guest. More with Mike after this short break. Stay with us. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Why is it we're not very good with our health regiment until it's too late? We don't put oil in the car until the engine blows up. When the body's out of balance, your health is not so good. Give your body some love. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Try our Life Change Tea, which cleanses you from harmful intruders. A clean colon is one of the ways to bring the body in balance. We also carry organic supplements to help you get where you need to go. 
So do your body a favor. Log on to getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. You can even visit our sales page to save some dough. Uh, does anybody call money dough anymore? Anyway, if you're looking for short, helpful health tips, go to YouTube and punch in Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. So log on to getthetea.com, shop, get balanced, then learn some cool tips at Health Matters Now. You'll be glad you did. That's getthetea.com. Your contact for current news and trending topics. KGRARadio.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black blend coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon Coffee banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Promo code F2B Blend. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. KGRARadio.com. When you're in the house for longer periods of time, you can see them flying or running across the floor. Ooh, yuck. They're unhealthy, gross, and disgusting. Bugs. I loathe bugs. We keep a clean home, but occasionally bugs show up. Well, I found something that is tougher than bugs. Orange Guard. On contact, it kills hidden bugs, including ants, roaches, and fleas. Plus, Orange Guard is a residual repellent. All of the ingredients of Orange Guard are on the FDA generally recognized as safe list. Orange Guard may be used around food, humans, and pets. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Orange Guard, available at orangeguard.com, Whole Foods, and Ace Hardware. Gold loves chaos uncertainty and disarray. History shows us what gold does when people aren't sure, aren't sure about the government, the stock market, their jobs, or their retirement savings. Our national debt is skyrocketing. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover. So what can you do right now to protect yourself? Call United Gold Group. We offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours. Are you worried about the stock market, we can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure, United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534 or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, Mike Ricksecker. I want everybody to go and visit Mike's website. He's got a lot of them, but you can start You can start with uh, MikeRickSecker.com. The links are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. And, of course, HauntedRoadMedia.com. The links are right there at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Now, Mike, one of the things that satisfies me today when I talk about ET, contact, aliens, what's going on here, um, is the interdimensional aspect of this. It's not necessarily... And nuts and bolts craft and 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 things because it solves a lot of questions and some of the things that i have seen and others there's an into these craft appear and disappear very quickly and that suggests to me something else besides 
you know, a metallic craft traveling for 10,000 light years across the universe, that there's something else interdimensional. And you say in the book <clears throat> that shadow people are interdimensional beings, that they are part of this universe. And that, that solves a lot of issues, not only with me, but probably with yourself too. Yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, the idea of interdimensional travel, uh, you, you think of, uh, an ET race, you know, earth is a rather young planet. We're only four and a half billion years old. The universe is almost 14 billion years old. So these other civilizations out there have had a lot longer to develop their technology and their, and their knowledge. So it, it stands to reason, I, I think very easily that many of these other advanced cultures out there have figured out, you know, that, Einstein Rosen Bridge, how to uh, you know develop a wormhole to travel from one place to another to be able to travel through different dimensional space because you know just the physical Newtonian trying to travel from here to you know the next uh, the next solar system and that's just going to take too too long you know too many years so how do we go about doing that and I believe they have figured out some sort of interdimensional travel in order to do that whether it's ET. And, you know, a number of these shadow entities are, are likely ETs. So, yeah, it, it kind of sums that up real nicely. Does that also solve, uh, there's another part to this, of course, uh, getting into the Fermi paradox. You know, we know that there's a lot of planets out there. There's a lot of stars out there. The numbers are growing every single day. But where are they? All right. There must be lots of intelligent life out there. But where is it all? And looking with telescopes and, you know, astronomers, you know, out there, they say that they're not seeing in, uh, uh, interstellar travel. They're not seeing evidence of that. Well, an interdimensional <laughs> aspect to all of this, you wouldn't necessarily see anything, would you? Yeah, you wouldn't necessarily see that. Also, our starship is going to be significantly smaller than a planet. But yeah, the Fermi paradox, I always get a kick out of that because um, th the way I look at, at that, well, you know, Earth itself, you know, let's look externally from our planet. If we're looking from, you know, say, Mars, you know, that means Earth is already an extra a planet with extraterrestrial life. If you're looking from another body out there, so that's already one in the Milky Way galaxy. So that's one in however many billion stars we have, several billion, out of several billion, you know, galaxies that are out there. So you can already start to do the math. You want an equation? We'll start with Earth as one and and start to expand that out. So it stands to reason there are you know billions of planets out there with the life. We just we haven't come across it yet. I mean, we are finding some exoplanets out there that you know may be in the Goldilocks zone, and we're still developing that that technology too. A lot of what we're finding out there for exoplanets are large gas giants that are you know too close to their suns. And I, I believe there's a lot more out there than just these large gas giants. We're going to, as we start to develop our technology more and more, we're going to find more planets that you could look at and say, oh, you know, that, that may be an Earth-like planet there. We found a few. I think we'll be finding more here soon. Well, I think the latest number is 20 billion Earth-like planets in the Goldilocks zone in our Milky Way. That's a yeah. crazy number, right? That's <laughs> okay, compared to, you know, 25 years ago when it was, you know, the first exoplanet was found and where right. the numbers are today, uh, it does not only throw the Fermi paradox off kilter, but uh, the Drake equation as well. And then if that's the case, we don't even know if their existence is in the same time that we are in. In other words, they could be in a longer existence or a shorter frequency, a shorter wavelength, and may not be visible to us maybe at all. It, w it would be noise to us and us to them, right? And that is where these the, the dimensions may cross and the frequencies may uh, become apparent to each other momentarily. 
Yeah, you're you're right. As you start, you know, gazing further and further out into you know the universe, uh, you end up with a lot of that background radiation. You know, how many things are out or you know way out there, and are they able to see us at all? As um, you know, you you get closer to, and there's there's a lot of you know different ideas about uh, you know the bending of space and time around black holes. Uh, you know, how do other uh, you know, how would time be perceived from other planets out there? How would, you know, if there's life on those planets, you know, how do they experience space and time? You know, it could very well be very differently than us. And I, I think there's a lot of things that we don't take into consideration that, uh, you know, other life forms out there are, while they may be, and people speculate, you know, are they, you know, other versions of us? Did we get seeded from somewhere? Possibly. But I also, you know, think that there are going to be other life forms out there that are completely different. Perhaps something that's on a, you know, much larger planet with a lot more oxygen. Perhaps they're, they're the ones that are, you know, 15, 20, 30 feet tall. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. Very, you know, different. And then ones that perhaps are smaller, less oxygen, and perhaps they're smaller entities. But that doesn't mean they're less intelligent. They could still be traveling here from light years away using some sort of interdimensional travel and, and actually still interacting with us now. Now, is there a possibility that, you know, I don't want to go into light beings specifically, but could some of these interdimensional extraterrestrials not have shape, right? And they are achieving a humanoid shape for us, right? Putting on, <laughs> putting on the fedora. You're putting on some sort of, yeah, and, and disguising themselves so that we have something to relate, relate to. to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah and... And that would make sense if they were, you know, perhaps they did want to have some sort of interaction with us or perhaps if they were accidentally seen so that we wouldn't, you know, become too scared or frightened or, or what have you. And I think a lot of times they are, they may actually be trying to cloak themselves and don't quite understand the physiology of our eyes and we're able to perceive them to some degree anyway and whether they come off as a shadow or some people report seeing like a shimmer man type of a thing, mm -hmm. you know, is, is that what these you know entities are you know uh, well you bring up a great point you know the white glowing eyes uh, uh, you know they get back on the ship dude just white don't glow you're freaking them out <laughs> <laughs> you got to tone it down a little bit but it would make a lot of sense wouldn't it that they would have uh, the ability to uh, achieve the humanoid shape some type of clothing, something to give them uh, uh, something that we could relate to because they've been studying us for a long time. They know what we look like. They don't need to come you know, into our existence with eight arms you know, looking like an octopus because that would freak us out. Absolutely. And I, I think a lot of times we don't think about, okay, what would we do if – we went to another planet, you know, how would we interact there? I mean, for one, we probably wouldn't immediately touch down either. We'd probably be sending probes and, and things like that down on the planet. Uh, and, and so maybe some of these things that we're actually seeing are maybe some of these probes and it could be biological in nature, given what their technology may be. Uh, but once the actual, uh, being comes down, yeah. How are they going to try to uh, present themselves. If it was us, how are we going to present ourselves when we go to that other plane? And so I, I think we don't, we don't always think of it in that context. Well, and when physics, uh, suggest, uh, certainly string theory and M theory, uh, not just four dimensions, but maybe up to 11, uh, dimensions, something has to exist in those dimensions. Right, and if we did go into a sixth dimension or an eleventh dimension, is that a, an entirely different universe? That's an entirely different world of things that we just don't see, but it is there. Yeah, absolutely. And some of those are subatomic, and so you know, what do things look like at that level? But just not even getting that far. I mean, take take like the the 
fifth dimension. Um, you know, what does that look like to us? I mean, the fourth is time. So you go above time. You know, we we kind of you know, put together the idea of a, of a tesseract. And so we've basically taken a 3D cube. We've put another 3D cube on top of it, you know, because that's about, I, I guess, as, as far as our minds are going right now. We'll just put what we already know on top of, you know, of what we already know. So we're just compounding but I, I think it's I think it's deeper than that. Uh, you know, the idea of um, you know being able to move in and out of time at will and seeing every single moment, um, you know, is absolutely fascinating. But what would that really look like? And what lives within that space is uh, I mean, that's a fascinating question. Well, it is because time to us is is our planet. Go, you know, uh, first off, the day twenty four hours. And then the year uh, going around the sun, but once you're off this planet, time is is not that anymore, right? That's that's it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. T time is just a human construct that we've put together to describe our reality and keep track of the seasons and all that. But once you're not on Earth, yeah, it's, it's very different. Now uh, let's let's go into another direction. Um, you you touch upon this, and I like the way that you frame this in the book which is time travelers. And if we go to even Stephen Hawking, going back to a, you know, a physicist and the way that he represents this, that uh, could some of these, maybe all, just be us from the future? Yeah, that, that's a fascinating question. This is something that I've been uh, getting a little bit more into lately because you, know, you hear these fascinating stories of uh, people who have witnessed apparitions. Uh, you know, it could even be you know shadow entities or whatever. But you know, when they when they look at those apparitions, like say a, a woman in a 1800s Victorian dress, and that woman turns and looks at them as if you know they're the ghosts. Um, it, it makes you really start to question. It's like something out of the others, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, there, I've been hearing more and more of these stories lately, where you know these uh, these apparitions that we are thinking are ghosts are probably not actually ghosts, but are actually visages of another point in time, and we're having some sort of time slip where we're able to see the past, and the past is able to see the future. And this is kind of what I was talking about before with you know, time all being concurrent, past, present, future, and there's something that happens that for a brief moment, two moments are resonating at the exact same frequency, and we're able to see each other for just a moment. Well, and then you could have the commercial side of it, right? Uh, time traveling uh, <laughs> vacation plans from the future, <laughs> right? Well, where do you guys want to go? Man, I want to go check out 2021. I heard it's pretty whacked out. And <laughs> and you're able to come back, but you can't interact, right? You can only observe. And you go and you're doing that, and you've got your vacation plan, and you've, you've got all of these great places you want to go and see, but suddenly you're visible for a moment, right? And you're not supposed to be. Going back to what Stephen Hawking said, where are they, right? If, if time travelers were here, well, maybe they're not allowed to interact. And maybe that is a possibility of what we are seeing in, and again, once in a while, interacting with. Yeah, yeah it's, a, uh, it's definitely an interesting idea, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, we, a lot of times when we're observing some of these things, you know, they are just observing us, right? They're just standing there watching and looking. And perhaps, like you said, maybe that's some sort of, of rule. Or perhaps the time travelers that are out there right now are just, you know, ones that, you know, maybe it's time travel. Well, again, I, I keep saying everything's happening concurrently, so they should all exist at any time. But just for example, let's say time travel is just invented, you know, 50 years from now. They're, they're coming back and they're just testing it out. What are they going to do? They're going to watch and observe. Uh, you know, but there could be some sort of, you know, um, you know, rule put in place. Don't interact for that fear of breaking something in the past that, you know, creates a different future. Now, what do you do with uh, the concept if we're going to stay on this physics side of this and the multiverse is something that 
is, is part of our reality. The math certainly suggests it for a lot of different reasons, but it comes down to basically observation. And if, uh, if you're looking at a particle and it's either here or it's here, um, then if it's at, you can't be looking at a half a particle, right? It's going to be one or the other. And if it's not here, then it's somewhere else. And that's where the multiverse uh, comes in in the world of physics, that the math says that these two things can exist in, in two different places at the same time. Well, where is the multiverse then? Where is this other universe physically? I mean, we understand where we are now, right? Physically, we can understand this, but it has to exist somewhere, right? Physically, it has to be there. So where is it? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, because I, I think we kind of have this uh, idea in our mind of, um, you know, all of these, you know, like bubbles or, you know, the idea of the marble. And so you know, we've got all of them you know together. And, you know, what would that be in this huge vacuum or whatever? But, you know, they're kind of all side by side by side. What if they're actually all on top of each other at the same time? And it's just a matter of being able to somehow access it, almost like flipping a switch and you you turn your room from one universe to the other universe. So instead of them being you know side by side by side physically, maybe they're just all on top of each other in the same place. Hey, take that a step further. Um, so if we're talking uh, interdimension, so if we're able to access an alternate universe interdimensionally, you know maybe the. Physically, it's already right here. It's just a matter of figuring out what that, whether it's a frequency that we need to tune into or what have you, that we're able to cause see. I believe that you know, real travel in this nature, whether it's time travel or traveling interdimensionally, is more of a conscious thing rather than like jumping in a DeLorean and doing something physically. Um, so I, I think it's a matter of finding that that right parameter to be able to turn that on and whether it's, you know, to travel from one time to another or travel to another parallel universe or what have you. I, th I think it's a matter of that. Have you seen the movie Valerian? No. Okay. That's your assignment. That's All your right. assignment. It's uh, the most recent film uh, from Luc Besson. It's based on a graphic novel, and it, it's a great film. All of Luc Besson's films are great, but there is a section of the film that is extraordinary and profound, and it's where, going back to vacationers, you can go to this interdimensional bazaar. Hmm. Go shopping, right? And so they pull up, and it's an empty desert, right? That's all it okay. is. You see a few people walking around. It's empty desert. But you put the glasses on, and you get activated, and then you look, and it is a shopping mall. And you can go in and shop and, and go and interact it is, cra and it's all on a frequency. That's it. It's there, right? It's there in this area, right? And everybody's going, wow, whoa, 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 right? <laughs> on and off with the glasses and, and jumping into this, but it is a frequency. Yeah, it's very similar to what I was talking about, sounds like, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's fascinating. And so it just makes you wonder, going back to shadow people. What is around you in your room right now as I observe you? Well, it could be a lot of stuff, right? Right now, but it's just on another frequency, and it just may be that simple. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Um, you know, I've, you know, it just when I've talked to people in the past about, you know, ghosts and, and things like that, um, you know, I've always thrown out there. You know, I think we'd be very surprised if that veil lifted and we got to see all the different things that were around us. There would be a lot more. But you know, that's just ghosts. And this is more than just about ghosts. It is about so many different things that I think if we were able to 
lift that veil, we would see all these different dimensions, all these different entities, all these different possibilities of a world around us that it would, I think would just completely blow our minds. I, there could be literally a million ships in our skies right now. Right. They probably and, are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, uh, I go back, uh, before we take our break, I'm going to say this as crazy as this sounds, I'm with, uh, about a hundred people. And we're all out doing a, a giant sky watch. And we're in the desert. And up in the sky, Mike, just go into your mind's eye and imagine this for a second. So we're all, and this isn't with night vision. This isn't with anything. I'm just looking up. And at that moment, well, all of us are just looking to the sky to see if we can see anything, right? So we're all looking up. But at that moment, this aquamarine glowing thing sputters it goes and then pops up and it's it's glowing it's not very high by the way and it's right here and it stutters and then it goes glowing and then in the sky a giant like that much of the sky it makes a backwards z and it lasts for about three seconds that's it. And then it goes. And then at the end of the. It's this big, man. Just. <laughs> and at the end, it, it sputters. And then it like flashed its headlights. It's high beams twice. And then disappeared. Now. As crazy as I sound saying that. That has to be something interdimensional. There's no other way to explain whatever. And we're screaming and yelling. It was, it was nuts. It was crazy town. But when we're talking about interdimensional and coming in and out of another dimension, that was perfect evidence of it. And as crazy as I sound saying it, it happened. Yeah, I, I totally believe you. I think, yeah, a lot of these things that we see like that that make no sense to defy our physics and just materialize out of nowhere, disappear into nowhere. Yeah, I, th I think we're getting a glimpse of these things coming in and out of our reality. And it's it's this interdimensional travel, this whatever whatever these frequencies are that you know, we're suddenly getting on for a brief moment to be able to see it. That ship knew that there was 100, 150 of us standing on the edge of that cliff wanting yes, to see something. it was able something. to observe you. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I, I, and just said hello. It was crazy, man. You know what? And the funny thing was, and I know that there are people on Twitter right now that are going, man, it happened. I was there, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, I, after that happened, I remember thinking to myself, I can never tell this story. I can't. I can't tell. The, <laughs> who's going to believe this? A Zorro's aqua, aquamarine glowing Zorro Z in, in the night sky. Come on. But it yeah, happened. It's pretty wild. But no, I, I, I believe you. Absolutely. Well, it, <laughs> it was nuts. We need to take a break. I'm going to uh, talk you into uh, doing overtime. Um, we didn't get a chance to talk about, uh, hunting for shadow people and, and some of the techniques behind that. And there's another, uh, situation here in reading the book. I just thought to myself, Mike, this stuff follows you. You are in the right place at the right time. Way too much. Do you feel that that is the case? Yeah, and that's a it's a deeper discussion. I know we're going to get to a break, and we can certainly talk about that because there is a reason for that. Okay, let's do all of that. Let's take our break right here. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, Mike Ricksecker. And, again, his links are over at jimmychurchradio.com, mikericksecker.com, hauntedroadmedia.com. We're going to take a quick break. It's overtime next. Stay with us. Vivica 
here and you are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I take Life Change Tea supplements every single day. It's what I do. Click on their banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fate to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one-year anniversary. That's right. One year, and as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30-day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation courses, and so much more. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play today and use coupon code 30 days free. That's coupon code 30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now, the Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Mike Rick Sucker is with us. And one of the uh, one of the things that I enjoy about heading into overtime is uh, we get to uh, explore and, and loosen up a little bit. But this is the other part. Mike is a first time guest on the show who covers everything that I love to talk about, and I am able to just and plus he's a host. He he knows what he's doing. So I, Mike, I get to go on autopilot tonight. This is like a night off. For me, I just get to talk about <laughs> everything. Well, a good time. Yeah, yeah. Just sit and chat because uh, these are the, all of the things that intrigue me so much about what is going on today. Um, now, there's another part to this, and we touched upon it right before the break, that uh, I can't help but think that something else is going on here with you personally. And uh, I want, can, can we jump into that a little bit? Why, why is it that you seem to be uh, at the right place at the right time too much? It, it does seem like that sometimes. And I, I believe what this is, um, 
I, some people see that's uh, just kind of sum it up like this. Some people see more shadows than apparitions, like I do. Other people see more apparitions than shadows. Some people, of course, don't see you know, much of anything, but um, I, I think that's because they haven't really come into a lot of contact yet. I mean, I came into contact with a shadow entity at a very young age, and I believe my own personal resonance, my own personal vibration became in tune to that because it was introduced to it. I had another uh, moment when I was 13 years old that was, you know, quite significant. We moved into a new house where, you know, I, I kept seeing this other this other shadow entity, and of course, on my different investigations. And so, my my personal vibration has become in tune to the vibration of these different shadow entities, and I, I believe that's what it really all comes down to is vibration everything in the this universe is is all connected through vibration i mean nothing around us is actually solid all these atoms are actually vibrating so um and these are all done on different uh on different frequencies and so uh my own personal frequencies become in tune to a lot of these uh frequencies of these different shadows and a really good example of this is I talked about it earlier was that shadow smoke that morphed into the apparition of a little girl. There were five of us up there that saw her, but we all saw her a little differently. So I saw her basically fully formed from the top of her head all the way down to her knees. And then she kind of faded away. There were others that saw her basically fully formed at the feet and then on up to the head and she kind of faded away uh, from the head on up. And others kind of like saw the, the torso the clearest. So why was that? Why, you know, we're all standing there essentially in the same place. Why are we all seeing her a bit differently? And that's because we all each have our own personal vibration. The little girl had her own personal vibration, but they're not all resonating on the same level. So we all saw her a little bit differently because of that. That is very interesting. Um, when when you start to ask others what they saw, does it surprise you that their perception was shifted? Not at all. Not at all because of this. And I've been... On, on so many different investigations in which, and this is what makes investigating the paranormal e extremely difficult, is one person can have a fantastic experience. They see something happen, and the others that are there don't. And they're like, what are you talking about? We didn't see it. And it. so when you're able to get corroborating stories together, yes, I saw that too. That's fascinating because there's so many times where something happens, somebody sees whether it's an apparition or a shadow or whatever it is, and the others don't. I mean, these things are like fleeting. They happen in like a moment's time anyway, so that already makes it difficult. But it's even more so difficult because of the fact that, because of this personal resonance, because we're not all vibrating in the same frequency. And these things, because of their very nature, where they're in and out of our dimension like this, I mean, that's how we're able to see them is through those frequencies through those vibrations now how do we explain voices when we're not dealing with vocal cords and we're not dealing with something that may not be physical then how do voices happen yeah that that's a great question and there's a couple of different ways to look at that so with a lot of these shadow entities you know, a lot of that is done through some sort of thought transference or telepathy when it comes to you know something like a you know, like a ghost or an apparition or something like that that's you know it's almost like a little more dicey but um that example i gave earlier with the uh with that wisp that crashed into that door the sound is working on a different wavelength so if these entities are actually in their own dimension crossing over, or at least we're seeing an image of them for a brief moment. Mm -hmm. They may actually be speaking back in their own dimension, their own plane of existence, their own point in time, whatever it is. And again, that sound is on a different wavelength. So maybe we're actually able to, maybe they're speaking that line in their dimension. We're actually able to hear it for that moment because that's on a different wavelength. Um, could be out of phase, but, right. but not to get, uh, all technical out of phase or in phase, mm -hmm. but 
in one of your videos, because I had this happen to me uh, on an investigation where we're in a room and audibly, not an EVP, not caught on, you know, a digital record, audibly like this with my ears, I hear a female voice loud and others in the room heard it. And, uh, you know, Tony Rathman and, and Tony and I looked at each other like what? Well, um, in your video, uh, one of your videos I was watching today, there's the word by right. Audible, just like right out. But there isn't anything physical to create that. Is it electromagnetic? Is there something else that is allowing a, a sound wave to travel through the air and then hit our ears where it compresses our eardrums and turns it into something that we can hear? Yeah, it's, that's a great question, Jimmy. I mean, it could be something like that. Um, you know, and that's kind of the that's really the great debate when it comes down to you know EVP, system body voices, things like that. How are they being generated? You know, obviously it's some sort of wave that we're able to pick up with our ears. Um, there, there's another great experiment that we did um, some years ago using uh, water to be able to create these different voices. There's a, a good friend of mine, Lee Ehrlich. He's actually a world-class diver. Uh, he's actually gone down into shipwrecks to, uh, to witness paranormal activity. And so he, he's worked a lot with water and he showed us this method. We were using a, um, a fountain at this old historic hotel and between you had to stand back like a certain distance. You couldn't be right up on the thing, but between the lup, 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 of the water you could hear voices and you would start asking questions you would get intelligent responses to this like you'd ask okay where are you from you hear distinctly st louis how old are you 33 it's like it was amazing stuff and we're hearing it audibly with our ears and even okay yeah the recorders are picking it up too but we're hearing it with our ears so somehow it's using the water to send those audio signals to us what is it um uh going back to uh, when you're doing a paranormal investigation where it seems to me when these this communication is happening that they feel confused sad lost like they don't understand what is happening to them, right? And I think that's something that scares us a lot about this, where they may be in some sort of purgatory or some dimension that they don't understand how they got there. They may not even know uh, that they, they they probably feel more physical. They think we're the ghost, right? Yeah. And, and there's but there's something for almost melancholy about what is going on. And so when you hear this communication, ultimately, what do you think? Do you think that they, they're lost? They're looking for yeah, help, maybe? Yeah, it's it's kind of a mix. And there are some tough situations there in which, you know, you come across a spirit that doesn't know that they've they've passed away or somebody that's very distraught that, that they actually have, that they no longer have their, their physical body. Some of them do seem to be you know, some sort of, you know, we're interacting with another place in time and they're not actually, they're not actually past. It, it, it's almost like one of those time slips again. Um, some of them don't want to interact with you for the longest time because it's, it's almost like they feel like you're intruding uh, within their territory. And I had a really interesting uh, experience one time it was on an old World War II airplane. We're getting nothing, nothing, nothing. Uh, we were very happy to be in this great historic place, but you know, no interaction whatsoever. And we're about to give up on it. And all of a sudden, I, I made it very personal in that I related, okay, you know, I spent six years in the U.S. Air Force. I know that came out of the old Army Air Corps, which you would have flown for in the Second World War. And once I made it personal like that, all of a sudden we started getting all kinds of interaction. We started getting EVPs. And so what I try to do when I go into these locations to investigate, I, I try to make it as human as possible. You know, I'll introduce myself. I'll just try to strike up some sort of conversation because I think the, the more human 
you make it, the more they can relate to what it is you're trying to do and they feel more comfortable trying to interact with you. How much of this is, uh, in the little time that we have left, one of the biggest subjects of all, uh, but <laughs> let's see if we can get some, uh, some of this in. How much of this is the power of the mind and manifesting? It's real, but we're creating it. Like you can even go back to like Slender Man and, and that phenomenon where enough minds in the planet are focused on it and this stuff is manifesting. It's real, but it's created by us. Yeah, it's the idea of the uh, Buddhist thought form, the uh, the idea of the tulpa. And uh, yeah, and Slender Man is you know, possibly one of those. Of course, it was a uh, internet invention. But now people claim that, well, no, he's actually out there. He's actually real. And uh, I thought it was really interesting in John Keel's uh, book on the Mothman that a story it had nothing to do with the Mothman. And he suggests that this shadow uh, entity that, that was seen at the um, – it's a haunted uh, house on uh, Gay Street in New York City in Greenwich Village that – uh, was actually occupied by Maxwell Grant, who wrote the old shadow pulp stories that he's suggesting this this shadow there is actually the shadow from from Maxwell Grant. So um, it's, it's absolutely fascinating that, yeah, some of these could have actually been generated out of our own minds somehow. And so that would, of course, take a lot more investigating and deductive work to try to figure out if that is the case. But sure, some of these could possibly be that as well. I... Um I read so many Slender Man stories and listened to so many Slender Man stories that I was starting to have some pretty fantastical dreams where I was getting visited, you know, and I was inviting, I wanted to have these Slender Man dreams. They were awesome. Right? And I would go <laughs> and I would go to sleep and, 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 and I thought to myself, this is, this is a possibility where if enough of these uh, fans of Slender Man are so focused on this that he's going to be in their room. He's going to be in their life. He, he's going to walk across the street in front of them. He's going to follow them because you are so focused. You and your friends, the power of the Internet, right? The, the entanglement of everything. You are in your own id going to manifest this into reality yeah it, it's truly fascinating and the the power of that many people you know putting their energy into something like that it's it's almost like you know you, you think about you know, a sporting event where sometimes it almost seems like the crowd can will the team to win the game you know is that the same type of concept we're talking about here where you have enough people putting energy into something like this to be able to actually manifest it. It's the power of the human mind and consciousness and everything comes down to energy anyway. So yeah, why not? Well, so when you're, when you're on an investigation and you're on location is part of your uh, emotion, your positive attitude or negative attitude for that matter, <laughs> um, bringing some of this stuff to life. Yeah. I mean, we all bring something to a, to an investigation. So, you know, somebody could have a, a bad day <laughs> and come into an investigation and that would, that would have some sort of effect to what's actually going on that evening. And, you know, it could be, you know, from, you know, if, if they just have a sour attitude because they had a bad day at work and, you know, the the entity that's there may or may not like that. So depending on who's there, if they if they don't like it, you know, maybe they're OK, I, this person has a bad attitude. I don't want to interact with them or could be somebody a little more mischievous and says, oh, they're having a bad day. I want to mess with them mm -hmm, and that mm -hmm. gets things riled up. So yeah, it just kind of depends on who's there. Well, so if you're in a prison, right, you're, you're in an old haunted jail or, or what have you, are you, are you aggressive? You're talking to maybe criminals, <laughs> right? That, that may have died. In, are, are you aggressive? If you're at an, a, an elementary school, are you more passive and more gentle in the approach? 
you know, how do, how do you take that? Do you, are there situations where you're more aggressive with these entities and trying to rile them up? Or is that just not part of your nature? Well, I don't, I don't go out there trying to provoke. I don't think that I, I need to, if I'm at an old prison and I've, and I've investigated many old prisons, you know, I will try to, you know, rel I'll try to relate to them as, as best I can. So what I try to get as much information about the locations and the people that you know, were there as possible to be able to talk to them on that level. So, um, you know, I'm not going to be out there doing the whole, um, you know, you know, show yourself sort of thing or mm -hmm. hit me or that kind of crazy stuff. I'm going to try to strike up a conversation. Um, interesting story. So again, going back to, you know, learning about the locations, uh, Ohio state reformatory, they, uh, they talk there about a, uh, a spirit that hangs out in the showers a lot that really likes baseball. So I'll go down there and I'll talk baseball in the showers and I do get interaction like that. So I, I, I try to take it to something that these spirits or entities may actually want to talk to me about. Now, this is a family show, talking baseball in the showers at a reformatory. <laughs> right, that goes into a whole nother direction. Uh, but what about, um, uh, this is always a fun subject. What about objects that move? You, um, in the book, and I, I wanted to ask you about this, and I'm glad that uh, we circled back. In the book, you talk about, uh, you have a photograph of a, a, of a staircase, and there's a picture of Lizzie Borden on the wall, right? Yeah, that, uh, that story was pretty crazy. That was a wild night um, at, at the Stone Lion Inn in Guthrie, Oklahoma, and that was one, the night started off where you know, I was just doing a basic you know, EMF sweep of the house, get kind of a baseline, and there was this energy that just overwhelmed me right by the fireplace my meter spikes out into the red and i almost passed out right there so and that was kind of like a prelude of things to come uh because yeah there were a number of things that moved that night um just to kind of tell the story real quick once we started the actual investigation we were passing through the entrance hall to what's known as the parlor suite it's a, it's a bed and breakfast and then run a murder mystery dinner theater we're going back to the parlor suite and notice that the bureau that's there in the uh, entrance hall one of the drawers is open a little bit we didn't really pay it any mind it's just okay it's open we're back there in the parlor suite for no more than about two minutes all of a sudden we hear this boom this slam from out in the entrance hall we go out there notice that the drawer has been slammed shut johnny gets out his tri-field meter i'm snapping photos and i got this fantastic white wisp between johnny and the bureau I didn't really notice that until you know later on. It's a great picture, by the way. It's in the book. It's a great yeah, picture. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But it's like, but wait, we're not done. <laughs> <laughs> so we decided we're going to split up into two groups because the parlor suite was really small for all of us. I start leading a group up the stairs. I got to the landing. This other girl starts up behind me. In between us, this framed photograph of Lizzie Borden just and it's, crashes it's, to the stairs. It's a big. It's a big picture, heavy frame. Mm -hmm. It's probably uh, two foot by three foot, uh, almost that big. Yeah, right? it's, it's, it's pretty big. It's big. Nobody touched it. It just, boom, crashed the stairs. So that, yeah, that was a wild night. Now, what, <laughs> what do you do with that? I mean, is, is, it, uh, uh, is, it, is it, how do I, how do I say this? Is it? Is it a ghost? Is it an entity knocking the picture off the wall? Is it the house reacting? Is it the house doing it? Are you getting warned off? It's on a, it's, it's, it's in a, uh, it's on the wall of the stairway. Is it a warning not to go upstairs? There's so many things that you can extrapolate from that experience. And by the way, that place is haunted. You look at it from the outside and you know you're not supposed to be ghost hunting there. I mean, you that, just that know That is it. hilarious, Jim, because that's what I always say about that place. When I say the Stone Line Inn in Guthrie, Oklahoma, when you walk up to it, you just look at it. You, you say, yeah, that's it. a haunted house. That is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's, it's crazy town. And then you look, and uh, of all things, it's an it's a, it's a, uh, image of, of Lizzie Borden in this heavy gold frame, and this thing just jumps off the wall. 
Yeah, so we would call that poltergeist activity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, poltergeist being German for noisy ghost, and it was it was you know being very mischievous that night. You know, and it was very unusual because we had investigated there many times, and this was the only night that something significant like this had happened multiple times. Usually, usually we'd get okay footsteps and some voices, some EVPs, that sort of thing. Um, but this was extremely active. So why was all this poltergeist activity going on that particular night? We never did get an answer. There's another uh, thing. I've only got uh, about uh, four minutes left. You guys, it's one thing uh, to see stuff with uh, night vision and you see uh, you see stuff shot like that. You guys are in the dark. You guys are, are hunting, and it's black. You can't see anything around you. You can't see who. You can't even see the size of the room that you're in. Does that does that freak you out a little bit? Uh, it, it, it can. Yeah, I, I I don't think people really understand that because they see the night vision and everything, and so so to them they're like, okay, you know, you can, but you don't see anything around you. Uh, you you try to stay safe. You keep a flashlight with you, but a lot of times. You know, we're trying to film so we don't have the flashlights out. And all we have is that little square, the little rectangle on the camera to try to get our way through the room. And so uh, you have to be very careful in a lot of these places. What are your tools? Uh, what, are, what are the two or three things that you have to take on an investigation? Well, like I said, you know, a flashlight, you got to be safe about it. Um, you know, of course, I like my my cameras and the audio recorder. Uh, one tool I think a lot of people kind of forget about is a notepad and a pencil. You know, take notes of what's going on, things you learn along the way, things you may hear or see. Because, uh, you know, going back over the, the audio and the video, uh, you, may, you may have something there that you take out of context. But if you have some notes, you might be able to, uh, you know, put it into a better context. What kind of meters do you take with you? Oh, uh, you know, I got a tri-field meter, a little uh, K2. Um, you know, I've kind of pared it down here uh, over the years. Like I used to bring an SLS camera and all this other stuff, but it's kind of cumbersome. And really, it's just, you know, I think really you just need to keep it as, as simple as possible. You don't need all this crazy stuff. Now, uh, where can everybody go and listen? And uh, what time and what day of the week is your show on KGRA? Yeah, KGRA, um, I have two shows on KGRA, Edge of the Rabbit Hole and Beyond the Shadows. They both air at midnight, uh, in midnight Eastern. Edge of the Rabbit Hole is midnight Friday night, and Beyond the Shadows is midnight Saturday night. And uh, who's on this weekend? Uh, this weekend, we have Joe Diamond. So he's uh, known as America's Greatest Mind Reader. So that would be a really interesting show. A little bit different than what we usually do. Man, I want him on my show. <laughs> yeah, I've watched <laughs> a lot of his videos, and he's just he's fascinating. Uh, really interesting guy. That's, that's too cool. And what is uh, the new show uh, uh, scheduled for Netflix? Do, do you have a crystal ball? Oh yeah, that's uh, I. I don't have an official date. It was supposed to uh, premiere on Amazon, and then Amazon changed all of their policies back in February. So, um, right now, I had to find a different distributor uh, to make all that happen. So, sometime here in the next month or two, uh, th then I'll actually get some sort of official word as to when it's going to premiere. But it'll be soon, and that's uh, the Shadow Dimension. You can get all the information on that at shadowdimension.com. Thank There's you so much, Mike. What a great conversation tonight. I look forward to having you on again. And, and tonight we had to talk about everything. Next time you're on, we'll focus on one subject for the whole night. Thank you so much. <laughs> Sounds great. Thank you so much, Jimmy. I absolutely appreciate it. This was fun. Absolutely perfect show. Thank you so much. Uh, Mike Ricksecker. And again, Mike's links are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com, MikeRicksecker.com, and Haunted Road Media. The book, Walk in the Shadows, like I said, I'm in my second read-through. It's a fantastic book. Thank you so much, Mike. Enjoy the rest of your night, man. Thanks. You too, Jimmy. Take care. We just went bumper to bumper, pole to pole, and I've got to jump straight into credits. What a great conversation tonight. Fade to Black's executive producers, Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vito, and Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Spaceboy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and syndication is KGRA. 
the planet. This broadcast is only copyrighted 2021 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tomorrow night, right here, Micah Hanks of The Debrief. Until then, I want everybody to be safe. It's time to fade to black.